Uh, so you're all very welcome for this uh, three hour plus uh, exercise to really look at the bonus return project in its final conference. Um, we're going to be getting um, presentations from uh, the partners that have all been involved in this and they'll be showing some of their results. Uh, you will be able to have a chance to look at um, uh, the results and, and pose some questions in the Q&A. My name is Arno Rosemarin. I'm at Stockholm Environment Institute. I have been involved in this project as well, but today I'm going to moderate this meeting. Um, so if we can go to the next slide. Yes, a little bit of uh, housekeeping here. Um, the event is being recorded uh, basically because we, we, we would like to have a, a record of this. Um, and that it will be seen um, by others that aren't here today. Your mics uh, have been muted as well as your cameras have been turned off. But don't feel shy uh, and don't feel that you're out of the meeting. You are very much a part of it. Um, there is a Q&A function and you can go in there at any time and write uh, things that are on your mind and we'll address those questions. Um, at the end of each session, there'll be a little bit of a Q&A as well. Now, just a little tip before we go on and start is that in the toolbox, uh, that, that banner with all of the, the different icons on it, there's three dots. And if you want, you can make, if you click on the three dots, you'll find uh, that you can see the screen in full scale and uh, the banner won't be in the way and you'll be able to actually see the entire presentation without any problems. You'll also see one picture at a time of uh, the presenter. So, um, so I think we'll then be able to move on to the next slide. So I'd like to present the first speaker and this is Karina Barquet from Stockholm Environment Institute. She has been the project coordinator for the bonus return project. She will um, invite you to this meeting again, if you like, um, with a welcome and also an introduction about what this project aimed to do and what it has actually done. And Karina will also be coming back at the end with some very key recommendations um, and some take home messages. So over to you, Karina. Thank you, Arno. Uh, you can click on next slide, please. So my name is Kina Barquet. I am the, like Arno said, the project coordinator of Bonus Return. Um, so many of you have been in one way or another part of this journey, but some of you are joining us for the first and last time. Uh, regardless of whether you're an old or new friend of Return, the purpose of today's conference is to share with you the results from the project and hope that this can be an input to ongoing and future efforts in the Baltic Sea region. So the project started in May 2017 and in, it will end next month in October 2020. The aim of the project was to explore solutions that are available, solutions that are emerging and how effective these solutions are for addressing the problems of eutrophication whilst contributing to closing the nutrient loop in the Baltic Sea region. Next, please. Our program had five objectives. Uh, reduce knowledge gaps through systematic reviews and SWAT modeling. Assess effectiveness of eco-technologies through sustainability assessments and cost-benefit analysis. Support innovation and eco-technology uptake through pre-commercialization plans and test beds. Identify gaps and opportunities to connect policy with innovation and markets and develop tools for stakeholder involvement. Next, please. We did this through our three catchment sites, Stupia in Poland, Fidis in Sweden and Vantanjoki and in Finland and in, uh, co in collaboration with the municipalities in each of the countries. Next, please. And what we're going to be presenting today is the final results uh, from these different objectives in the project. And the day is divided into two parts. The first part will have four sessions. Each of these sessions is between 20 and 25 minutes, including a five minutes of Q&A. As Arno mentioned already, please write down your questions. We will try to address them now or later. Next slide, please. 
The second part uh, involves five presentations and we will be coming back from a short coffee break at 2.35 and the aim is to end the meeting at quarter past four. Uh, over to you Arno, I hope that you enjoy the meeting and see you in a little bit. Okay, thanks Karina. <clears throat> and we will be tough on time here because I know with online meetings, um, Sometimes things can take a little longer because of the logistics and stuff, but we'll I'll try to keep this meeting on time. I'll be introducing each speaker and I will be giving them a, a two minute warning um, when we, we have two minutes left. Two minutes left. So we're going to start now with the results from this project. And um, the first speaker will be Biliana Makura uh, from Stockholm Environment Institute. Um, um, Biliana has been in charge of uh, evidence base and knowledge gaps research. She's been looking into what sorts of technologies, eco technologies, what sorts of practices there have been for the circulating of nutrients and carbon within the agriculture sector and the wastewater sector, and how these, in fact, have uh, what things they have in common. Um, so uh, you have. 10 minutes, um, uh, 20 minutes for, the, for this um, this talk. It's 15 for this for the talk itself. Five minutes for the discussion. Um, so please, Biljana. Thank you very much, Arno. Thanks for this uh, introduction. Um, next slide, please. So as Arno already suggested, uh, today I will try to summarize the, uh, the results um, of um, uh, work package um, in bonus return project that uh, tries to uh, address and find that tries to actually isolate and, and highlight the, the, the knowledge gaps and uh, through systematic uh, evidence uh, synthesis. Next slide, please. So uh, systematic evidence synthesis um, are actually systematic uh, maps and systematic uh, reviews uh, that are uh, very comprehensive um, methodology for synthesizing and coll collating uh, evidence in a very transparent, repeatable, in objective matter. Uh, here on the slide, you see just um, actually all the steps that we conducted in order to uh, uh, come up with uh, with the um, findings of uh, either systematic maps and and uh, systematic reviews um, and if you come to the next slide please uh, we will see the uh, actually what we call the evidence synthesis pathway and this is uh, just a little bit of explanation about the methodology of uh, how we come uh, to the findings that will uh, follow immediately after so first we uh, with a stakeholder engagement uh, actually with with a, a continuous discussion with our uh, project consortium we have uh, identified the, the knowledge needs in the uh, field of uh, um, technological uh, uh, solutions um, and uh, we have then um, conducted um, uh, two systematic maps. Uh, these systematic maps are actually uh, just used, um, we use them to actually identify the knowledge gaps and knowledge uh, clusters uh, and to understand what evidence exists on the subject of uh, um, eco-technologies uh, in um, for recovery and reuse of carbon, nitrogen and, and uh, phosphorus. After that, we then uh, conducted the two systematic reviews that try to answer the question whether specific eco technologies are effective or not for uh, reuse and recovery um, of nitrogen and, and phosphorus. We hope that these findings can then be fed into decision support tool and inform the policy and practice of uh, technology of um, of um, um, kind of uh, uh, po policy and practice uh, when it comes to uh, decision making for reducing uh, eutrophication in in the Baltic Sea region, etc. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, 
So uh, first I will try to just uh, quickly summarize uh, what we have done uh, in, um, in a, a systematic map of the evidence of ecotechnologies uh, in agriculture. Uh, we have, uh, after a thorough process that is uh, visible on, 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 on this uh, website, uh, on this slide, we have included over 177 studies in this map. Uh, we try to map any kind of technology or practice undertaken for the purpose of recovery uh, and reuse um, of uh, carbon and, and, and uh, nitrogen and phosphorus in agriculture. And um, we have searched for literature that was published between 2013 and 2017. This work is published and the reference to that work you see below. Uh, next slide, please. These are our findings. So uh, most of the uh, mapped uh, eco technologies were basically uh, um, the technologies that are um, uh, and practices that are uh, anaerobic digestion, soil amendments, uh, vermicomposting, uh, and these uh, eco technologies are mostly being implemented in uh, manure as a as a waste stream and. Um, and, and these are just, uh, as I said, as, as we have a limited time, just a, a kind of a uh, overview, quick overview of, of the results, but most more, more results you can see under uh, in, in this reference that is uh, presented uh, at, at the very bottom of the slide. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the evidence atlas that shows in geographical space where are all these studies and eco technologies uh, that we studied in systematic map located. This uh, um, evidence atlas is available on Bottoms Return website. It's browsable and you can uh, play with it and understand what uh, um, where are the studies and, and all the details about about the studies included in systematic mapping process. Next slide, please. Uh, now, then, um, in parallel to the map of uh, what eco technologies uh, exist in the, in the space of um, agriculture and what technologies and practices are being implemented to reduce and uh, to recover um, and reuse uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and carbon uh, from agricultural waste, we were also looking at the technologies that were used for uh, recovery of uh, and reuse of nutrients uh, and carbon in uh, the uh, domestic. Uh, uh, wastewater systems. Uh, and we in this map we included uh, 474 studies. Next slide, please. Uh, the results uh, told us that there are many technological solutions to recover and reuse uh, nitrogen, phosphorus and, and carbon. These technological solutions were uh, mostly in our pool of literature, microalgae cultivation, irrigation with influence, reuse of biosolids, anaerobic digestion or, or co also combination of different uh, eco technologies. Um, uh, the blue uh, lines show the um, a recovery tech, uh, eco technologies uh, that were mostly present in our evidence base and the uh, orange lines show the reuse eco technologies. On the pie chart, you can see uh, uh, that most of our eco technologies for recovery of nutrient and uh, nutrients and carbon were actually applied to the mixed uh, wastewater and also to uh, sludge in this um, um, map. And this uh, work is uh, being submitted to Environmental Evidence Journal and we are, um, I think, uh, soon expected to be published uh, in an open access uh, forum. So you can uh, see more. Some of, uh, next slide, please. Uh, uh, when it comes to the evidence uh, atlas for this systematic mapping, uh, th that is already available on Bonus Return website and you can come uh, there and, and find um, all the studies uh, included in the map and, and understand uh, uh, what these studies were were exactly about from this uh, sneak preview of, of the results of the map. Next slide, please. Oh, we have some. Uh -huh. OK, so after uh, this big mapping exercise, we decided to together with the uh, with the stakeholders, we decided to um, actually understand not only what evidence is available uh, when it comes to specific eco technology, but whether specific eco technologies are being effective or not when it comes to the uptake uh, recovery potential of N and P compounds. So first we wanted to know how effective are throughout precipitation and ammonia stripping for recovery of nutrients in the liquid phase of anaerobic digestate. 
Um, and so we, we uh, took the subset of, of the um, uh, evidence that we mapped in systematic map and proceeded with a systematic review. Um, in this systematic uh, review, we have included about uh, 28 studies after a thorough process of uh, screening and, and validity assessment of these studies. Next slide, please. And we have come to the uh, uh, conclusions that uh, when actually performed at pH around 9.5 and magnesium to phosphorus ratio of at least one to one, throughout precipitation seems to be an effective technology for the recovery of phosphorus from the liquid phase of anaerobic uh, digestate. When it comes to uh, understanding of that potential for recovery of uh, um, uh, nitrogen from ammonia stripping process, we sadly could not have any conclusive um, um, answers to this question because the evidence base was, was very limited. To, to come to a conclusive uh, results. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, after that, we wanted to understand whether the product of struvite precipitation, which is struvite, and the product of ammonia stripping, which is ammonium sulfate, are effective as fertilizers. So in the first question, we uh, kind of looked at the recovery bit, and in the second question, we, we focused on the reuse. So what happened with this leftover of, uh, uh, of the struvite precipitation process and uh, ammonium sulfate process when it's applied on the fields and used as a uh, fertilizer? I have to say that this work is uh, under construction uh, still, but uh, we have some preliminary results. And if you come to the next slide. So pre uh, preliminary findings suggest that struvite performs as well as mineral fertilizers, uh, uh, both when it comes uh, uh, to the biomass yield and when it comes to the uh, plant uptake of uh, phosphorus. Uh, again, the evidence base was uh, limited for ammonium sulfate, so we cannot say much whether the ammonium sulfate is um, according to the current evidence and all the literature published after 2013. On this subject, we cannot say whether ammonium sulfate uh, um, according to the scientific evidence is effective or not. Uh, however, as I said, some preliminary results that you can expect maybe um, during uh, later this year to be available in open access or early next year, hopefully not that long, um, suggest that uh, through white performers, as I said, as well as mineral fertilizers. OK, I think um, with this, I, uh, uh, I would like to finish my presentation and I would like to say just uh, one concluding remark. I have bombarded you with all this technical uh, 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 kind of um, uh, uh, language and, and uh, uh, some of the, uh, the findings, but I would like to say that uh, I guess what uh, my, um, what, uh, what uh, this research uh, shows uh, is that technological solutions are available um, out there and there are myriads of different technological solutions that can be applied for um, uh, to different uh, waste streams in order to uh, uh, recover and reuse nitrogen and phosphorus to prevent eutrophication, etc. But I hope that uh, in the rest of this uh, day today and in the rest of the presentation, you will learn a little bit more about political Political context um, about innovation, uh, about how these uh, technologies are actually uh, being implemented, um, what are the facilitators and barriers to their implementation and innovation in this uh, in this field. So thank you very much, um, Arno. Over to you. Fantastic. Um, and you're early. You had 15 minutes, and you did it in 12. So. Um, we uh, don't have any questions yet from our audience outside in the cyber space, but we have actually some questions from within the group, um, uh, the partners, uh, some of whom are actually in the same room with you. So um, I would like to sort of, I think one of the one of the most interesting things is when you is is to explain what is a systematic map, because I, I think for the people that don't know. Uh, that, I think that's, the first, that's one question. Um, and then related to that is what's any, what sort of distortion in the results can one imagine if we just keep to the English language? 
Thank you very much, uh, Arno. So yes, I try to very quickly uh, uh, explain what are the systematic maps and systematic reviews at the beginning of this presentation, but I appreciate that that might not be um, as, as clear as it should be. So the systematic map uh, or systematic mapping is a, is a process to collate, collate the literature in a very comprehensive, uh, transparent and repeatable manner. Um, uh, using multiple sources of literature, both academic and, and grey literature. And in, um, in contrast to uh, systematic reviews that answer uh, whether uh, a specific intervention is being effective or not, or whether uh, uh, there is uh, impact of specific exposure, systematic maps are actually producing literal uh, literature maps and, and showing uh, what evidence exists in a, a specific subject. So uh, uh, the output of uh, systematic maps can be the heat maps that shows where are the knowledge clusters and where are the knowledge gaps um, on a specific uh, subject that can be uh, quite uh, broad in this sense. So uh, uh, we could then uh, out of uh, uh, knowledge, identified knowledge clusters, we could then recommend uh, systematic reviews or out of knowledge gaps we could then make uh, recommendations to researchers where to invest um, their efforts into creating more primary research um, so that that is a systematic uh, mapping uh, process in brief but uh, here on the website there is my um, here on the sorry uh, on the screen uh, people can see my um, my email address so uh, more than welcome to to write uh, if they need more cl clarity on that and and more examples uh, when it comes to uh, your other second question, uh, actually we uh, do strive to, in this both maps, we were looking at uh, studies published in English language, in Polish, uh, uh, Swedish, uh, 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 Polish, Swedish and Finnish languages. And these are the languages that actually also reflect uh, the, the, the countries. Um, surrounding the the some of the languages not all of course surrounding the the, the baltic sea and uh, uh reflect the the skill set of the of the people involved in this research and there are many many researchers involved uh to produce these findings so uh, if we keep only to the english language i think it wouldn't uh change much the results uh, uh to to cut it short uh simply because there was no uh, many studies uh although we searched for them very thoroughly very comprehensively there was not so many studies uh that were in other than um english uh languages mm -hmm. so i don't think that that we will have a different uh much different results. Okay, thanks Thank for that. you. There is a question from the audience. Um, this question is what's the potential recovery from wastewater? And I guess they're thinking of um, nitrogen and phosphorus, but um, in comparison to mineral fertilizers, and I'm not quite sure what they mean by that, but I guess it means. Um, when you get the recovered product, like struvite, for example, um, how how is it when you compare it to like the concentration of um, of an NP or, or, or in, in a mineral fertilizer? So, is it a competitive product? Thank you very much for this uh, question where I, I can just say what we have uh, uh, found and, and repeated in, in our study. I'm, uh, maybe someone else can also uh, add to that, but I can just say that according to the to our findings um, and we have not looked at, uh, for example, economic uh, side of the of the production of, of uh, struvite and and uh, so I, I can just say that uh, struvite is as uh, as I mentioned uh, before as um, as effective uh, um, as other uh, mineral fertilizer and uh, I guess it can be uh, relatively cheaply made through the struvite precipitation uh, process mm -hmm. but maybe I should um, allow someone else from my colleagues who are currently here to to add to that uh, answer. Mm -hmm. I think we, get, we can probably collect a few questions that, that are, let's say, technical in nature, and um, you know, we should be able to go back to that. Because um, there's another one, and that is because um, you were mentioning the ammonium sulfate that is produced when you acidify the ammonia after scrubbing. 
this is usually an anaerobic um, digestion. So um, the question is, shouldn't that ammonium sulfate be like any other ammonium sulfate that, that you would find in a mineral fertilizer? Um, so why should it be any any different? You don't have to answer that if you don't if you don't have an immediate answer. Well, I personally, as a as a um, let's say, I'm not a chemist, but I'm a I have I have a lot of experience with wastewater. I I would expect that um, ammonium sulfate is ammonium sulfate. Question is whether in fact uh, you get the kinds of concentrations and the costs involved to produce those concentrations. I think that's where the bonus return project has been looking at those pros and cons. But so I think the, the question is, and the answer that provided by that person, yes, we're talking about the same compound. Yeah. I agree with you. Or? Yeah, I yeah. think we are talking about the same compound here. It's just that this is the ammonia sulfate coming from the recovery yeah. uh, and from the waste, actually, yeah. recovered from the waste sources. Thanks. I, think, I think we're just about, um, we're right on time, so I'm going to actually um, go to the next uh, speaker. Um, and actually, there's two speakers involved, and um, these are uh, two researchers. That's Eric Sherman from the RISE Research Institutes of Sweden, and Søren Marcus Pedersen from the University of Copenhagen. Um, I know Eric has a great background in wastewater and uh, Søren is a accomplished uh, professor of e economics. So the two of them will be looking at the criteria, the multi-criteria. Um, I think that's Eric's job. And then the CBA, the cost benefit analysis that, um, that Marcus was looking at. And you both have each 10 minutes. And then after that, we'll have a five minute question period. So please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, Arno. Uh, this is Eric Sharma speaking. I will give the first speech here, and then uh, Sarah will come after me. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'm really involved in uh, this work package where we have uh, um, developed and uh, carried out multi-criteria analysis of all these three uh, case studies that Karina uh, uh, showed in the introduction. And uh, <clears throat> what we did was that we had uh, a series of two participatory workshops with, the, with each, within each of these uh, areas. And the first, first uh, workshop we worked with uh, defining the scope, what should we look at? We, the, the project's uh, limit is uh, wastewater and uh, agriculture waste, but we needed to limit it down a little bit to make it doable, so to say, for each uh, case study. So what, that was what we discussed with stakeholders, the first workshop, and we also discussed about uh, sustainability criteria and you can see the table down here where we were selected through this process. We also did some literature review in parallel so we had a discussion so there were bo both uh, input from the stakeholders and also some literature input to this. You can see that we, we used more or less the same type of the same criteria for all three case studies but with some uh, variations actually. And uh, the, the criteria is both uh, ecological, uh, economical, sociocultural, and also technical, technical robustness, so to say. So that was for the first uh, workshop. And in the other one, we uh, uh, they had to weigh between the, the criteria. We were uh, producing a result uh, scoring for uh, different alternatives that I will show soon. For each case study, then we were, they had, the stakeholders had to weigh between them. Next slide, please. So this is actually what we compared in each case study in Swopia in Poland. We looked at municipal wastewater and rural wastewater, and we were uh, comparing a baseline, the, the situation today more or less. Uh, with the three future scenarios with uh, reject water uh, uh, type of system, 
uh, recovery system, nutrient uh, extraction from uh, wastewater and the source separation scenario. We could also go to Fyris in Uppsala, Sweden, where we also had wastewater as the scope. So we were looking at uh, both, both urban and rural wastewater. And here we also compare more or less the same alternatives with some variations. And the uh, last one time we had a different scope. We were mostly focused on agricultural waste and um, also some uh, wastewater in terms of small scale wastewater from rural areas. So an integrated system for actually horse manure grass that we could harvest that is not used today and um, and rural wastewater. Next slide, please. And here is the so to say winning uh, scenario for Vantan Yoki, which gave the best sustainability score. And here, as I said, we have an integrated system. We are collecting horse manure and the grass from fields and uh, treat them. Uh, in in an anaerobic digestion um, uh, process. So we get biogas and we get uh, nutrients out of the uh, out of the substrate. And also not to forget also parts of the wastewater from rural areas is also uh, uh, transported to this facility. So a little bit more than a half of all the the rural wastewater is used in this process because we need water actually that's the that's the uh, reason for uh, for uh, using uh, rural wastewater but we don't need everything so we have also a separate system of hygienization and using use of the um, wastewater as a fertilizer in itself so this this was the most favorable alternative for Vantanyuki. And now we can take next next slide, please. In Supia, where we again looked at wastewater only, no agricultural waste actually. Here, the winning scenario was a nutrient extraction system from uh, uh, from use of mixed wastewater using an, uh, an uh, organic or uh, biological treatment and the nutrient extraction in terms of struvite and ammonium sulfate, which should be used on agricultural land. And we also had an agriculture use, use of the sewage sludge, which was composted. Next slide, please. In the third uh, case study in Fyris, we had the winning scenario was a source separation system. It was actually quite similar as the winning one in Sopia with the nutrient extraction from wastewater, but we also uh, in, uh, included uh, source separation to some degree. It's, I think it's around 20% that we were uh, assessing that could uh, get this system for a quite short term. So it's mostly, the, most of the Uppsala and other inhabitants, they have a, a, an, uh, uh, the same system as today, but around 20% has this uh, source separation system. So it's an integrated one where we have uh, nutrient extraction, both from the source separated substrate, but also from sewage sludge actually. And it's uh, um, and should be used as fertilizer in the agriculture. Yeah, so that, yeah, please, text, next slide, please. Here <clears throat> was in parallel with this multi-criteria analysis, we did a cost-benefit analysis and we used the same scenarios actually, which is very interesting to look at two different methodologies and we got some results which was differing and we got more understanding uh, looking at both of these. But I will not say more about this because this is what Søren will talk about in a few minutes. So let's take the next slide, please. Uh, our findings, uh, lessons learned here is that uh, uh, actually soft aspects like uh, sociocultural aspects, economical aspects, maybe not a soft one, but these are very important and 
uh, have a lot of have a big influence on the results. We saw also that interventions, if you look at a very big scale scope with a lot of criteria, you can get the results that actually the existing system could be better than one that seems very good at the beginning. That we have some examples on this. Most of the future system that we have looked at is actually more preferable than the existing one. Non-technical aspects again can play a decisive role in, in sustainability or innovations. Uh, wastewater management typically uh, it's a quite costly to uh, change wastewater systems. So uh, uh, that's the problem with it. You could say the infrastructure is quite expensive. So it's easier with uh, uh, waste system, solid waste systems, because they we actually got a profitable actually system uh, from this anaerobic digestion in which is very interesting. It seems profitable. Just looking at uh, uh, a broad scape uh, uh, scope, so so that's interesting. Uh, but uh, if we are looking at eutrophication, which is the, most, is the biggest aim with uh, bonus return uh, and bonus, then wastewater interventions are more effective. You get more uh, uh, impact on reducing nutrients to the water. Next slide, please. You have about a minute left. Yeah. Um, uh, here we can say some recommendations. The scale is a complicated thing. I cannot go into that more, but uh, it has a lot, lot of influence on the results. Uh, Non-technical aspects are important again. Uh, sensitivity analysis has a, has a large, uh, a big uh, influence. And uh, uh, we uh, also but this is more four and five is a little bit more from Søren's coming presentation about cost benefit analysis. So I think I stopped there actually. Thank you very much. OK, fantastic. So we're going to go to Søren Marcus Pedersen from the University of Copenhagen. OK, uh, then uh, I think I would like to go back to this slide with the cost benefit analysis which is like two slides back. Yes, this one. Thank you. Well, uh, we were kind of sitting on the shoulders of the work that was done by RISE and, and the colleagues in the sustainability analysis, and we were trying to get a little bit more into, how can I say, the cost and benefits of, um, of these uh, eco-technologies that were kind of introduced in these uh, three catchment areas. And, and that was in Slupia, in Vansanjoki, and in Furizon in, in Sweden. Uh, our cost benefit analysis is uh, based over a time frame of uh, 30 years. Uh, we calculate uh, the net present value into the year 2020, which is this year. And um, uh, we look at uh, kind of a baseline scenario, which was kind of the current situation for the three catchment. And then we say, OK, if you introduce these different eco technologies uh, in these uh, different catchments, what will then happen with the cost and benefits uh, associated with these different kind of uh, technologies? And uh, we looked into both uh, what we call uh, market benefits, but also what we call the less tangible non-market benefits, which is uh, uh, related to uh, greenhouse gas emission and uh, eutrophication. And uh, we used uh, uh, we used the, the study was based on uh, benefit transfer uh, in the sense that we used uh, benefit values from different or from other studies or related studies that could be used for this uh, type of uh, analysis here. Um, so um, the final outcome from this uh, cost benefit analysis was that uh, several of these uh, eco technologies uh, was not when we looked at them isolated as here. Uh, how can I say economic viable? Uh, we could see that uh, 
those uh, eco technologies that were related to uh, agricultural waste in in Bantanjoki in the Finnish area. Uh, both, uh, I mean, in, in principle, the uh, anaerobic digestion uh, came up with a, a relatively good net present value or positive net present value, and also the thermal treatment was uh, provided a how can I say a relatively high net present value that was close to zero, if you can say so, compared with the baseline scenario. Um, the baseline scenario in Vansanjoki was a little special because we used um, uh, we used uh, how can I say there was no central uh, composting plants in Vansanjoki for for composting agricultural residues at the time, so we we said that the baseline scenario here would be uh, setting up composting of uh, horse manure and and agricultural residues, whereas for the other two uh, areas we could set up a baseline scenario that was uh, uh, based on um, on the digestion of sludge and and then conventional treatment of sludge in the two other areas, but otherwise we compare the baseline scenario for each of the area with this this new situation where you have the new eco technologies. When we look at so, so for Vantanjoki, we can say that we could see some positive uh, net, uh, net present value for these two, uh, or at least for the uh, anaerobic digestion, we could see a positive net present value, whereas for the thermal treatment, it was very close to, to, to uh, uh, provide a, a positive value. Uh, for Slopia and Furizone, uh, it seems like the investment cost for these uh, technologies that, that we presented here, the nutrient extraction and, and uh, Source separation. Uh, it was. Um, it was. It is related with relatively high investment cost. So even though that these uh, technologies provide uh, relatively high benefits in terms of reduced eutrophication, uh, these non-market benefits uh, was not high enough to cover the initial uh, investment cost for from from uh, these um, uh, technologies. And then you can also say that for Vantanjoki, um, there were relatively high, how can I say, market benefits related to, to uh, recovering the, the agricultural waste uh, for these uh, technologies. We also did a, a small sensitivity analysis on these technologies. And you can see here that, for instance, in, uh, in Furizone, uh, you have to increase the value of eutrophication or the price, non-market non -market, uh, value of eutrophication with uh, 3.7 times uh, in order to provide a net present value that goes into break even or, or zero. And similar in, in uh, with reject water scenario in Slopia, you also have to increase uh, the price with 1.2 to reach a net present value that goes into zero. And so on, we have also done other sensitivity analysis on some of these uh, technologies. But it has been a relatively, uh, how can I say, comprehensive study where we have included uh, a lot of variables and there is also obviously a lot of, uh, how can I say, reservations and so on in regard to such study because uh, we couldn't get into any corner, if you can say so, of the, of the benefits that are associated with these technologies. For instance, you could also say that um, it could be uh, reasonable to say what is the extra benefit that you can gain from from reduced uh, pollution from overflow of uh, water in the sewage system. Uh, there could be other benefits that we uh, haven't included here in this study. And also uh, the fact, for instance, that uh, there is a lot of uh, uncertainty in terms of these, uh, whether you use abatement cost or willingness to accept uh, cost of different kind of non-market values um, that could make changes into the uh, final uh, assessment of these uh, eco technologies. But uh, overall, you can say that this is the, the kind of um, the outcome that we came up with in this uh, study. I don't know, maybe uh, we can go to the last slide uh, here to, to capture some of these uh, recommendations. Uh, basically, you can say that we have um, we have focused here on uh, on a 30 year period and, and uh, essentially uh, you can say some of these technologies, they might have a, a larger uh, time range than maybe up to 40 years or so, and that could change some of the, the outcome of these uh, uh, eco technologies. Uh, and uh, 
As I mentioned before, it could also be possible to include a broader range of co-benefits uh, that we have included in this study. We have mostly focused on the eutrophication impact of uh, phosphorus and, and nitrogen, and also the greenhouse gas emissions from uh, from uh, uh, changing uh, the, the from the baseline scenario to the new technologies here in these uh, catchment. Uh, then another issue that could be considered is that uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, debate about what should be the what kind of economic and policy incentives could could be helping to how can I say to uh, to make sustainable uh, technologies like this more profitable. For instance, we know that that uh, mineral P is a, is a is a, uh, there is a limit resource of of P in the world. Most of the P at the moment is coming from from Morocco today. The mineral P. And what are the, the policy incentives or what kind of uh, incentives should be provided to, to make a change in the, in the market price of P uh, uh, in the future? So these are some of the elements that also could be uh, considered for, for future research uh, into this area. So I think that was what I had to say uh, for now. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. <clears throat> we have a few questions from the audience. I'm getting some feedback. I'm not sure. Um, let's see. I mean, we could go directly back to you, uh, sir. And that Jennifer at the uh, Agriculture University in Sweden has asked, um, how did you calculate the non-market values and which non-market values were actually included? And put on your microphone, sir. Sir. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Good good. Was that a sinful uh, unmute of my microphone? I guess. <laughs> 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 okay. No. Uh, <clears throat> when it comes to the non-market value, uh, we have used uh, uh, we have used uh, the the how can I say the willingness to avoid damage costs for 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 phosphorus and and nitrogen. That is the kind of the. Um, uh, and we have used uh, benefit transfer. We have used it from other studies. Um, and, and then you can say for, for CO2 emission, we have used the abatement cost uh, uh, in the sense that um, it is very much to, to very much difficult to, how can I say, to, to assess the willingness to avoid uh, damage cost of CO2 uh, or greenhouse gas emissions. So we have based the, um, the, the how can I say the non-market cost of CO2 that is based on the recommendations from the European Union and uh, it's based on uh, different prices uh, on or market prices on non-market prices uh, depending on uh, the different targets that you have from uh, 2030 and up to uh, 2050. So we have actually uh, we have um, we have made uh, the market we have made a kind of a projection of the market prices into the future and and uh, and made a how can I say a function of what are the different market prices from year 2015 and up to 2050 um, depending on the different targets that you have in 2030 and and 2050 of uh, the of the uh, greenhouse gas emission cost so basically what you can say is that the cost increases uh, step by step from 2015 up to 2050 in the range uh, about 100, 100 uh, euro per tons from 2015 or, or slightly less than, uh, than 100 and uh, 100 euro per tons in 2020 up to about 500 euro per tons uh, when we get closer to 2050. So we have included the change in, in the cost here. Okay. I don't know if that was an uh, an answer to the question. I, for me, it was. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to jump back to Eric. You've got a couple of questions waiting here. Someone from um, whose name is uh, Berbel Muller Karulis. She asked, um, "Why did eutrophication get such low weight in the multi-criteria analysis?" Uh, why was it so unimportant uh, for, for the stakeholders? 
It's a very interesting question. We didn't actually analyze uh, why they uh, really weighed as they did the stakeholders, but uh, maybe the, the, the thing is that they feel that wastewater management is has a quite high level already uh, regarding uh, reducing nutrients to the waters. So I think maybe circularity of nutrients and, and aspects like that, which is a little bit of a future questions that they have to think of, got a little bit higher way actually. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a little bit of a speculation because we didn't really ask them why they will wait as they did. And then we also said something and another question from an anonymous person. Um, can you clarify more how the wastewater options are more effective for eutrophication than the agricultural interventions? Because you actually said that. Yeah, no, I just meant that uh, there are more nutrients uh, in the loop in the wastewater than from horse manure grass and grass. So uh, there's a bigger potential actually because we have quite uh, uh, low standards at at least the rural systems. So there is a lot of potential to reduce more nutrients in the wastewater sector compared to this uh, agricultural waste. Okay, um, so there's a question. I'm just, I'm, I guess this is actually going to um, either of you. It's a, it's sort of t this is from Elizabeth Karnstrom at RISE and um, she writes that she's surprised that the source separation comes out so badly because in a, in a study in Stockholm, the source separation alternative compared to today's system, plus the um, membrane filtration, at which we're, we see at the Hammerby Hrista, that came out as more beneficial, um, mainly because of its decreased release of pathogens and medical residues to water and due to the possibility to recover heat. So, I mean, these are the questions, and I think maybe maybe Søren can look at this because it's sort of other factors that could be brought into to whether things actually are, are cost beneficial. Um, the question is, is the source separation, um, at least on paper, did better on eutrophication, but it um, wasn't the largest factor. It was only the fifth in the order of magnitude. There's a study on that. So um, I don't know if you understand that question. It's um, so it's whether, yeah, whether the source, source separation, yes. why, why it came out so badly. Well, I think, I mean, uh, overall, I think the uh, the reason here is that uh, the investment costs are, are relatively high for this, uh, for implementing uh, the source separation in terms of uh, treatment plants, uh, incinera uh, incineration plants, uh, uh, there are costs associated with um, with ammonia stripping pumps in the sewers and the sewer system as such. So 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 there are also uh, I mean there obviously there are uh, both uh, market and non-market benefits associated with this uh, technology. But but so far uh, it's uh, I mean the, the most simple answer to that is that the, the costs uh, to our knowledge for 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 the investments here are too high so uh, to, to cover the uh, to cover the benefits associated with the technology okay I'm, I'm sure that that question might come back um, to us a little bit later it's obviously a very interesting one um, thank you Elizabeth for that one so it is time to go to the next paper um, and so if we get to um, the next paper it's going to be given by uh, two people. So if we could go to the next uh, slide, that would be great. So we're looking at the modeling efficiency of the eco-technologies in the three river basins in Finland, uh, Poland, and in Sweden. Um, so we'll, to give this paper, and we have two of the experts here have been working with the modeling on these rivers. And the first one is Yari koski Aho from the Finnish Environment Institute. Sometimes that's called Psyche, um, for those of you that know that. Um, and the second paper um, after Yori's is by Thomas Akruzko. He's at the 
uh, Warsaw University of Life Sciences. So let's move, you, you each have 10 minutes and then there'll be a five minute discussion. So I'll start with you, Yari, please. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. You can go to the next slide. And here we can see the uh, case study catchments that we had in this in this project. Furison River in Sweden, Vantanjoki River in Finland, and Sloopia in Poland. Next, please. And uh, what we used here as a model, we used SWAT. Uh, soil and water assessment tool that is uh, developed in Texas, USA. And we deployed it here in, in our catchments and as inputs, SWAT uses topography, that's digital elevation model, uh, soil type data, land use data and weather data. And in this simplified picture, you can see that the SWAT then calculates the catchment processes, then channel processes, and then it gives results. We were interested in, in it gives several results, but we were interested in, in nutrient loading in, from these case study catchments. And the results are given in one day, one month, or one year time scale. And we can also add point sources and agricultural management practices, which were, of course, important for us because we we tried to try to simulate those those uh, eco technologies that were presented by Eric and Søren there. In in that in this sense, SWAT is very versatile and uh, and useful. And uh, we made two papers out of these uh, modeling exercises here. Uh, first was this uh, that was published by me and my co-authors in ecohydrology and hydrobiology. That was about those uh, three ecotechnologies more in more detail. How, how would they reduce nutrient loading to get uh, Baltic? And the other one was uh, more, let's say, wide scope uh, uh, paper about those river basin management plant plans of water framework directive and they were more like upscaled in nationwide perspective that uh, paper will be it, it's already accepted in ambio uh, next please uh, the results were in one time yoki we tried this uh, this uh, agricultural uh, eco technology which was this uh, anaerobic digestion in a centralized plant with those uh, those um, organic side stream from agriculture and and uh, also from from uh, scattered settlements and uh, we found out that these uh, amendments of uh, organic carbon that is pro produced uh, in addition of course to energy that this anaerobic digestion produces it produces a lot of organic carbon and we amended that to agricultural soils in one Tanyoki catchment. And what it does uh, to improve uh, the, or, or decrease the nutrient loading is that uh, if you uh, increase organic carbon into agricultural soil, you will um, improve soil, uh, soil structure, soil water holding capacity and so on. And we changed those parameters in, in this SWOT model to see the effect. And our result was that the effect was very small with the amounts that this, this, kind, of, uh, this kind of production would, uh, would produce to the Pantanyaki soil. But the effect was there. It was visible, but very small, like less than 1% of the total loading. Uh, the bullet point is missing here, but uh, those, uh, those um, uh, wastewater technologies in Sloopia and uh, and uh, Furis on, they, they produced a little bit higher reductions in, in nutrient loading to the Baltic Sea. They were at maximum something like 7%. And uh, when we compared these eco technologies with uh, traditional agri environmental pest management practices, we, we saw that uh, these practices, when, we, when they are used in combinations, they are, they are uh, more effective than, than these than these eco technologies alone. 
And then uh, I think that Thomas can continue from here with those right side bullet points. Thank you, Yari. Thank you, Arno. As you see, we are trying to be really uh, interactive in this story. Uh, so uh, I would like also to stress that we were very strict in modeling in the very same way three catchments, and that was appreciated by reviewers that, that we did really the study which allows for comparison on both sides of the uh, Baltic the result because uh, we were close with our methods and resolution of the models. In this uh, second more catchment oriented uh, modeling, uh, we were also trying to see the pressures in the next 15 years, so just not to touch the climate change, assuming that we are in the same corridor of climate change as last 10, 15 years. And we were looking for the, the uh, changing in population, in agricultural practices, uh, in the in the yields, etc., uh, and uh, the finding was from this prior modeling study uh, that we don't see the major changes uh, in the in the, the pressures and also no significant decrease in the nutrient loads uh, which can be expected. Yes, yeah, so, so that nothing spectacular in the terms of going down with the loads we cannot expect if no action is assumed. So then we put on top of that the plant water framework directive uh, measures uh, to the to the catchments. Uh, there is significant difference in approach uh, that in, in Finland and Sweden agriculture is a major player in those measures. In Poland mostly uh, that's uh, 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 wastewater treatment as we are still in this big program of uh, investment in the sewage treatment plants. Uh, and uh, then we uh, do see the uh, uh, decrease uh, of phosphorus uh, and uh, connected to those measures because that was the second scenario. Then we were trying to go more in this HELCOM proposed approach to, to be uh, as much as possible precise in targeting the measures to the uh, regions which are parts of the catchments where we can expect the, the biggest uh, outwash of the nutrients. So, so the, the, the heavy soils, the bigger slopes, uh, bigger point pollution. Uh, and and that that's, again was was good good idea because we, we have uh, got extra benefit by targeting them the same number of measures uh, but in the particular uh, placing of them uh, and then I, I think it's also important to notice that we are trying to play a bit with this hydrological uh, uh, parameters or characteristics of the catchments to see where our findings can be recognized and as you see from the figures those three small catchments in fact findings can be upscale up to almost 50,000 square kilometers on uh, north and south uh, of uh, Baltic. Yeah, and maybe Yari can take for the next slide. Yeah, some, some lessons learned. Uh, we can see that the factors behind these historical changes in nutrient loading, they are very slow and long term processes and uh, instead of quick and dramatic reductions, uh, we can expect long term slow trends towards the better. The, uh, although the soil, soil amendments did not show very, very high reductions of nutrient loading, they were positive and uh, you have to be patient here, just like in a, it's, it, it's very, very common in, in, in water protection. You, they are very, very slow, slow trends that you can, you can expect. And uh, there's no one single measure. You have, to, uh, you have to use very many well-tried measures, both these traditional pest management practices and also these carbon and nutrient recycling eco-technologies. And what was uh, important finding in our in our in both those papers that we, we have published now important lessons what that was that uh, you have to use these all these measures uh, 
targeted manner, not not everywhere, but where where they really where they really make make an impact. Targeting is is key key here, and um, I think that uh, Thomas also will have something to say about yeah. these gaps and lessons learned. Yeah, so so uh, we are one of those, uh, I, I, I would say, growing number of voices uh, saying that the key is uh, a common agriculture policy, that especially agro-environmental schemes should be somehow uh, tuned with the water framework directive, in, and in this respect, both can gain. I, I mean, have have uh, better results both on the. Uh, uh, land side, but especially for 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 water. So uh, I would say bonus results or this particular uh, exercise results. And my previous experience says that without common agriculture policy tuning to water framework directive or vice versa, we we cannot get too much on Baltic Sea and agriculture. So so that the that and in this paper you you really see the the the, the number which comes out if we, we do uh, work on, on uh, agriculture. Also, Polish case, where not too much of uh, agriculture measures uh, are applied, uh, shows how, how big gap is then uh, if we play only with traditional water uh, measures like uh, sewage uh, water treatment plants. And of course, uh, the, the, why we thought it's important to make this upscaling uh, uh, exercise, uh, I will come to that also later, uh, that, that uh, we, we need to see from it from the policy perspective. And if we come from the small catchment, then, then it's very often says, yeah, that's the, the, the case study. Uh, but but uh, we would like to, to, to be seen more uh, that uh, the catchment perspective, in fact, is a regional perspective or policy perspective and calls for some changes in the in the policy, not only in the management. That, that will, I would say that the most important policy lesson from what we have done. And I think we can go to the next slide and back to Yari. Yeah, what we need as a future research, I would say that empirical research is, is more and more needed. And, and of course, on top of that modeling on the effects of these carbon amendments and carbon and nutrient cycles. And what's the effect to the nutrient loading to Baltic Sea? That, that's, that's really important issue. And uh, of course, SWAT is not very good in, in uh, simulating organic carbon it's very good with nutrients but not so much with carbon but i know that they are developing it's a pity that Mikolai is not here now but uh, i think he has some colleagues he knows some colleagues that are really really hard trying to trying to uh, target in, in in that that issue and uh, i don't know if if thomas you would like to say something about those well Last yeah. two ones. Yeah, so so uh, I think equally important uh, uh, to modeling is the monitoring. In fact, we had only one good monitoring uh, station for the carbon. It's Vantanyoki, and uh, that's why we could make another paper to Journal of Hydrology on, on this measurement frequency. But but. Uh, uh, there is a number of, of statements about the importance of organic carbon in waters. How does it change the habitat? But we, if we if we go in Poland, it's very bad, but but not too much better in Sweden. If we want to go for the hard data to see where we are in this respect. If I am in this water world administration, it is also important that number of ecotechnology we we touched in in bonus we still cannot model it's it's not only SWOT case that the model we use but also a um, number of models are uh, which we use in hydrology and use them for uh, water management planning are not really meant for ecotechnology which uh, pop out now and that's uh, that's a to me 
a problem to communicate those fundings to the water planners who believe more when they see the results on the catchment scale. And the, the, the last thing which I am trying also to bring to different agenda, uh, there is a number of projects, like bonus included, where we uh, are very much focused on uh, smaller catchments. Tradition for the modeling comes from the north, from the catchments you have uh, on, 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 uh, uh, on your side of Baltic. Uh, and uh, we also then uh, here in, in the south uh, go for the similar size to make comparative study. But I think the game changers are these big uh, uh, river basins, uh, starting from Odor and uh, 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 through the uh, Viswa, Nomas, Daugava, uh, or Neva, uh, at least on my side, and 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 uh, better modeling of the processes, and not only counting the load, but also the pathway of nutrients. That, from this perspective, uh, should be done much more closer uh, comparing to what we do to today to get to give a good policy recommendations and that that's that's i think the open questions for the future projects similar to to bonus and that's the end of the story on my side thank you okay is that the end of the um, presentation i think that's a good yes i think so okay thank you very much for that um, we have a number of questions here. Um, I mean, you ended up saying, Thomas, about the, uh, the, the seven big uh, river basins. And the first question is, uh, what is actually hindering uh, better understanding through the SWOT uh, modeling? What, why is it that you, you haven't been able to uh, tackle this as much as you, you wish? But, but but I think there are two things. Uh, one is about the technologies and to to in, in, in incorporate them. But for the for I think for the big rivers from the from the uh, our part of 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 uh, uh, catchment is very much the data. Yeah. So uh, SWOT is capable, and we do quite a bit of modeling. For, for example, of Odra and Viswa in, in in my group, but still on the quantity. And for the the quality, the the data is the the the, the problem, uh, and then we can see not only about the loads and the sources, but also the pathways, and see if some of those pathways can be somehow halted or de decrease the, the the load which comes to Baltic. So that mostly it's a, a question, I think, of the organization and money to make it. The the, the knowledge is key. So you're talking about uh, number of monitoring stations. Yeah, and including them in the in the models on appropriate scale. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you also mentioned Thomas something about the the targeting of measures. So yes. the question is, uh, what um, what does that actually mean, and whether we actually have the data to do that, or if the data is not there, what I mean, what sort of data would be needed? Yeah, uh, I think for the targeting, first of all, we need some common sense. I mean, from the hydrological perspective, where we can expect the biggest outflow of nutrients. Uh, and uh, the most obvious are the soils and the, 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 the slopes uh, and the way uh, the, 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 the uh, land use. Uh, and that's from the hydrological perspective. The, the second, probably more uh, uh, difficult, is to see if we are able to apply measures in the places where, which we think are should be targeted from the hydrological perspective. Uh, do we have uh, agreement with the farmers who own the land, etc.? And, and that's the second part. Uh, if the location is targeted uh, by our analytical tools, do we have means to apply them there? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I, you know, uh, so Yari, uh, your colleague Sirka Tateri, she's also online. Um, and she is asking what sort of experimental field scale study would be needed um, 
to improve the modeling of the soil organic carbon processes in, uh, in SWAT. So what sort of field scale experiments would, would be needed to improve the modeling of SOC? Uh, of course, you might have two approaches there. You, you, you could have parallel uh, field blocks, one with those organic amendments and one without. And then there's, of course, possibility of uh, doing before after experiment. But uh, and I think that there are already these field block experiments, but it, it is like in in all kind of water protection. The problem is that you can see the effects in field scale or field block scale, but in catchment scale, the effects are very, very hard to hard to find out. And that's that, uh, in my view, uh, calls for very long term, long term monitoring of catchments and modeling uh, in parallel of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, here, of course, these new new technologies with uh, monitoring technologies, these automatic measurements are very important. Mm -hmm. um, there's a question about um, legacy phosphorus. There's a lot of talk about the fact that over it's from the 1950s onwards to the 1990s, there's been a lot of fertilizer added uh, to the farm fields around the Baltic. And it's one of the reasons why uh, in the runoff, um, we are still getting significant amounts you know, that are getting into the Baltic Sea. And in fact, the phosphorus levels are maybe not going down as fast as we would like. So the question is how, what's the mass balance on, can you pick that up? Um, can you actually separate out um, legacy phosphorus from, let's say, the current um, losses from uh, from the various sources, can you can you actually get that in the in the SWOT analysis? Uh, well, in SWOT you can. There's only this this uh, soil phosphorus that you can give there. Uh, it, uh, I don't know if you can separate it. Uh, is it legacy or? And of course, you have annually given fertilizer amount of That's fertilizers it. there. Yep. But uh, you get you can have a so-called uh, base level soil phosphorus there, and on top of that, uh, annual amounts of fertilization. Which so can, the course, answer be zero. Is to, to some extent, yeah, with this or, or just exactly here, it also we we, we have this basic or the f first uh, uh, statement about the amount of phosphorus binded in the in the soil profile. And then that's the starting point, but but we don't uh, make it very much on the process base, also to some extent. To some mm -hmm. extent. But you are absolutely right, and this uh, uh, legacy, especially on heavy soils on north of Baltic, was coming out few times in our uh, research as a as a very important problem to, mm -hmm. to see and to recognize. It is going down, but really slowly. Mm. And we have about two minutes left. To um, you know, th th this whole question then of applying the water framework directive to the models. I mean, that's easier said than done, but how is that actually done that, uh, technically when you're, when you're doing the calculations? Do you put cutoff points that are like um, thresholds? Is that, how, do, how do you actually do it in SWOT? So in our case, uh, we were doing uh, first quite extensive research of the particular catchments, what in the river basin management plans from the coming six years uh, it's planned to be applied. Yeah? Uh, some, some of those measures are located uh, in, in particular places. Some of them we, we have to assume where they might uh, pop, uh, pop out. And the discrepancy is, can we model all what is planned in the form of the SWOT, how many tricks you have to do or how many of them are missing? But, but in, at least in our approach, the key was river basin management plans uh, uh, and, and the, the way uh, how uh, measures which 
should affect nutrients uh, are planned. So not not all range of measures in the water framework directive. So in this respect, you are right. Mm -hmm. um. There is someone asking about the, the legacy phosphorus before we close for coffee. Um, what about legacy P in the sediment in streams as well as lakes? Is that something you have data on? Uh, I think that is what only uh, uh, takes care of <laughs> or, or deals with uh, uh, loading from catchment yep. to the yep. lake yep. Uh, and of course it, it's a really big problem this internal loading of phosphorus that is already there in both in in Baltic Sea and in, in the lakes but SWAT doesn't uh, take that into account. But you will I mean uh, being a limnologist I can say that when the lakes um, start turning over in the, win in the winter time that's when you start getting sediment coming through so you should be able to get that in a suspended uh, material. Yeah. Yeah. OK, so it is time for coffee and I uh, thank you all for your presentations and those in the audience. Uh, please don't go away and um, we'll be back in 15 minutes and there'll be uh, some other really um, interesting sessions that we will go through. So we are going to go to the next speaker and um, and that is going to be Stan Stenbeck from RISE, the Research Institutes of Sweden. Um, and he's going to look at the innovations that the project has been investigating and promoting. Um, and I think that so you've got um, 15 minutes to do that. And you'll be looking at the toolbox as well that you've developed. And then uh, there'll be some videos from the, the companies that have been doing these innovative uh, little projects. <clears throat> uh, so that will be a 10 minute uh, part of the thing with the innovators. So go ahead, uh, Stan. All right. Hello, everybody. Nice to meet you all. It's very interesting to hear all these things. So I'm based at the Research Institute of Sweden in Stockholm. And I've been the uh, project manager for the for the work package. I mean, a work package leader for number five here. Uh, next, please. Next slide. Uh, the objectives of the work package five was to select a number of promising existing or emerging eco technologies in need of test beds or living labs, uh, facilitate pre commercialization of selected eco technologies in three pilot sites, identify and set up test beds and living labs for those three selected eco technologies. So um, we did that these years and the approach was used to achieve the approach we used um, for these objectives was to develop a toolbox for decision makers interested in pulling new innovative and circular eco technologies to the market as a way of uh, solving the challenges of tomorrow with uh, new promising technologies of tomorrow coming up. So please take next one. Uh, the final toolbox had about 15 tools, but I will now only go through the main tools used within the work package five, uh, which included to organize an innovation competition, select three winners to get further pre-commercial support in their development towards market introduction uh, by using, for instance, relevant test beds or other support. So the approach uh, we, we would like to show you is, can be summarized in four main um, challenges for decision makers. And these four main ones we have put up in this slide, starting from the balloon on top, where it says, how do we assist in pulling not yet ready eco technologies to the market? Um, well, this can be answered uh, through using three tools. Um, the first one was to, is to form a partnership for applying for a public and private research and innovation grant, which actually bonus return as a as is in total is an example of where where they have found um, uh, a grant to to develop this project. The second one is to set up an innovation procurement process according to the special rules and regulations for products and services not yet ready on the market 
but needs some uh, last validation and pre-commercial support. For instance, needing a first client or something like that. So that is procurement approaches to support innovation, to, to develop a budget for it. A third option could be to organize an innovation competition, which we then did within the bonus return project. Um, could, could, you could consider this to be a light version of an innovation procurement. But in an innovation competition, you can set your own rules, while a public innovation procurement has some set rules and regulations from, from public laws and regulation. And these would actually require some capacity building and training. So we set up an innovation competition as a way of, of creating a room for new promising technologies. Um, in the next balloon to the right, we can read another challenge for a decision maker. Which eco-technology is the most sustainable? This is, of course, a quite a complicated question, and we would recommend uh, using the bonus return experiences from using sustainability analysis tools and, and so forth. I won't go in more into detail in that, uh, as uh, there are other experts in, in the room here. But in the lowest balloon, we find the challenge, which was part of the award to the winners of the innovation competition organized within the, this work package. How do we increase the readiness level of innovative eco-technologies, which means how do we assist in testing and validation of the eco-technology through independent test beds, for instance? Uh, succeeded validation for an innovation together with a typical client is crucial for further scale up and sales of the product. The last balloon to the left asks for the framework for how readiness levels are defined and illustrated, which has been developed actually through the bonus return um, uh, work package five. Uh, and that is what we call the innovation development cycle. So please next. Uh, the innovation development cycle is an illustration on how innovation develops from the basic ideas and principles via, for instance, prototypes, testing of these, development by first innovators, but then perhaps in cooperation with a client, and all the way up to a market introduction and hopefully a market success. The basis of the different readiness levels comes from the framework of TRL, technology readiness levels, which is used within, for instance, American NASA program and European Horizon program. Um, this is a scale going from readiness level one, which means you have a basic idea of your product and you think of to, to what you want to achieve to the readiness level five, nine, where the product is purchased, installed and used successfully by several clients. Within the bonus return project, the TRL ladder has become an RL cycle, a readiness-like cycle. This is, we have taken away the technology notion just because we think that it, it's much more important with business models and communication skills and uh, instead of technology. So readiness level is, is, the, is the notion used here. Um, on, and also we have put it into a cycle instead of just put it into a linear uh, ladder. The readiness level one to nine has been clustered into four main phases of the development, where phase one is when the first idea, principles and conce concepts are developed, while phase two is going leading into testing of the prototypes, leading into phase three, where the prototype is tested together with clients in relevant environments. This then should lead into the last readiness level eight and nine, which is the, the phase four of market introduction and even market success. You can't reach phase four without a market success, so it must be worth uh, va valid and working. Next, please. So this framework, we can use them to, to analyze and understand the different procurement models. Um, uh, because there is a difference between what we could call a traditional public procurement and, and what we can call an innovation procurement. Uh, a normal public procurement, including, for instance, sustainable public procurement and circular public procurement, is about procuring inno innovative but market-ready products and services that are in the phase four, while an innovation procurement is about supporting not yet market-ready products and services to be either a PPI process, a public procurement of innovation, where the product is validated by a so-called first client, 
or by a PCP process, pre-commercial public procurement, where a couple of products are selected to get research and development support by the procurer. All the innovation procurement processes should, of course, have circular and sustainability criteria as part of the procurement, even the innovation procurement. So in the bonus return project, these differences were cleared out, but we only did, we never did a full um, uh, innovation procurement, but we did an innovation competition, which can be seen as a light version. Um, an innovation procurement, a full one, could actually though be a very good further development of the bonus return project for municipalities and decision makers in the Baltic region. So that is a recommendation to go further on and do a full scale. Uh, next, please, a full scale uh, uh, innovation. Pool. I also wanted to say that what is this about? There, well, there is a need for a first client. Both innovation process is based on the crucial step of a product to get a first client and their first product uh, being purchased. This is to build the reference for the continuation. This often means to uh, as a stalemate case for all <coughs> for the for the development process, as no client wanted to be the first. And the innovation procurement process forms a risk sharing process beneficial for both the buyers and the sellers. So that is so you can see in the figure the the innovator, the innovator um, over the time by the blue boxes, you can see them reaching um, to get the first product sold and then scale up on sales. They go from readiness level three, five going up and then it, they really want to get the first product, product on, on sale. And then from the other side, you see the gray boxes coming down, which is the procurer that wants to find new innovative uh, products. And then uh, you, you do an innovation procurement and thereby having a risk sharing uh, of 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 of, um, of the work. Next, please. So, as we mentioned before, an innovation competition could be considered a light version of an innovation procurement, and actually a good step for a, for a group of buyers wanting to pull promising coming coming innovations to, to challenges that can be solved by by um, solutions that are not on the market yet but are promising. So this was done through the Work Package 5 uh, and the three most promising innovative solutions for the bonus return Work Package 5 um, was uh, set up by uh, this innovation competition. And we also then set up some test bed. As part of the award of the winners was to get pre-commercial support to the solution to assist them to higher readiness levels and closer to a market introduction. Um, uh, we could then also put all the regulations as we we needed to, to put them. So the winners uh, the winners uh, got this support and a test bed uh, was set up for one of them and the other ones needed other types of of innovation support. Next, please. So test beds is a key element for innovation develop into market readiness to become a market success. So um, the test bed is often set up already in late phase one, but could also be featured in phase two and, and especially phase two and phase three, I would say. And we did then a test bed for one of the innovators that were winners in the competition. That was the Aquacur Biofree technology, which was tested in a test bed outside Stockholm at Knista wastewater treatment plant. So the lessons learned from this is that the setup requires more of very much planning and, and stakeholder involvement to it was quite complicated to set up the, the test bed, but it was very worthwhile to see how the, the plant worked in, in reality. Next, please. So here are the three winners of the innovation competition. And um, it was Aquacare's Biofree, it was Terra Nova Energy, um, uh, plant and it was Ravita new technology uh, that was um, uh, winning as very promising emerging technologies. Um, so Aquata did a test bed project while uh, Terra Nova was prioritizing to get a comparative study made made whether we were comparing different competing and complementary technologies. Uh, very similar to Terra Nova or in, in the output of Terra Nova. 
uh, but then Dravita uh, got support by we, that we where, where the project did a, a initial market survey among um, uh, potential clients in the in the Stockholm and in the Swedish uh, market where owners of wastewater and treatment plants. So Ravita has a, an efficient way of, of working with, um, uh, with, uh, with the wastewater and uh, Terra Nova creates a, a very good um, energy uh, and also a good way of circling the nutrients. Uh, anyway, so this is the, that leads into then the, uh, the, the, the videos which we will now see from, from these three um, winners of the innovation competition to see how they have um, taken the next step. Uh, they did this videos just uh, last week uh, so that we get, get the latest update on how things have been moving since, since Bonus Return Project. Okay, so let's see if we can go um, watch these presentations. Right, you, yeah, you need to, to change to the next one, I think. So the first one's Ravita. Yeah. They have done this, uh, these videos by their own equipment. Hi, and greetings from Finland. My name is Kate Plumberg, and I work as project engineer in HSY. We're really honored that our project Ravita has been selected as one of the winners in bonus return competition. Since 2015, HSY has been developing innovative nutrient recovery technology called Ravita. The main drivers for this research is that we want to be able to recover and utilize the nutrients in wastewater without compromising any of the excellent quality. In this way, we can provide more sustainable operations also in the future. Our process enables the recovery of phosphorus as phosphoric acid, which can be then further processed into ammonium phosphate. In the Ravita process, the phosphorus is recovered only in the effluent wastewater. So contrary to any conventional co-precipitation, in Ravita process, no precipitation whatsoever is applied prior or in the biological treatment. The phosphorus in the effluent water is separated in post-precipitation steps, such as disk filtration. The chemical sludge that is produced in the filtration is then further processed in order to separate the phosphorus. The following step includes dissolution and recovery step with solvent extraction. In addition to phosphorus, also nitrogen can be recovered in the process. The nitrogen is recovered from the reject water stream and separated with a stripper unit. In 2019, Ravita demo plant with PE of 1000 was built in the Vigimaki waste with a treatment plant. We'd be really honored to have had the opportunity to be part of the bonus return community. In bonus return, we've gained extremely important support and insights into the markets of this field. In processes like Ravita, engaging and understanding the clients and end users is crucial. Nutrient load reduction and nutrient recycling technologies are important in all over the Baltic Sea region. And we truly see that Ravita is an important step on that journey. Okay, now we go to Aquacare. Aquacare's innovation is about reducing phosphorus to very low concentrations and to prevent uh, the harmful algal blooms. Uh, this includes an adsorbent, it's an ion exchange resin that's impregnated with iron oxide nanoparticles so that these can uh, adsorb uh, phosphorus and then these can be uh, regenerated so that the adsorbent can be reused and the phosphorus can also be recovered in a much more concentrated stream. Participating in the bonus return has been very helpful in the sense that uh, we could connect with different people who are in similar phases um, of their innovation. So we could see what are the challenges faced uh, by other uh, innovators. And at the same time, through this event, we could also connect with the research institute in Sweden, which helped us pilot our technology in one of the sites where we could 
treat wastewater effluent as well as surface water and test how good our technology is in realistic conditions. In terms of opportunities, there are a lot of point sources of phosphorus that are discharged into the Baltic Sea. So this would be a great spot and a great opportunity for uh, the Aquacare's biofree technology to be applied um, like at wastewater plants effluence and then you know we stop it at the target so we prevent the formation of the harmful algal blooms in the first place. So this is an opportunity that Aquacare can use. In terms of challenges, there are two types of challenges. One is the technical challenge, which is in terms of technology, how we are going to handle uh, the water at the Baltic Sea. It depends on the constitution and the composition, like how much particulate phosphorus is there, how much dissolved phosphorus is there. So there are still some key aspects that, you know, need um, monitoring and based on that we can further fine tune our technology there. Uh, also includes studying more into the regeneration and reuse uh, of the adsorbents and recovering the phosphorus. Uh, but for these technical challenges to uh, happen, we need to have a bigger drive and this is the bigger challenge, uh, the challenge that's related to making business. And this is in terms of uh, legislations and policies uh, that make it a mandate to, you know, uh, showcase why we need to go so low on the phosphorus levels. I think these this legislative challenge is, is a bigger challenge, like we still need uh, a good market to be there so that we can keep working and we can keep improving on our innovation. Uh, and in the end, you know, um, look at the bigger goal of uh, stopping the pollution at the Baltic Sea and also trying to recover the nutrients. Okay, um, I think I think Aquacare is done. <laughs> now we go to Terra Nova. Except I don't hear the audio. So Stan, if you want to tell us what he's saying, <laughs> if you can mouse read. <laughs> oh wait. <laughs> Can provide some background on this this technology. So I think I we've think lost we've lost uh, the turn over there. Unless um, someone else wants to add, like Stan, you could you could just give us a two minute uh, summary of it. Uh, well, I'm not really. Um, it was sent very. Um, that video was actually sent very late, so I haven't uh, watched it so many times. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, uh, I think, but is, is it possible to get it to start over again, or is it is it mm. done? Ian, do you have a, or should we take questions? Yeah. Uh, it says um, Ian says move on. I think I think there's something wrong with the with the connection there. So. Um, but, but we do have a question. We do have about, I can tell you what the timing is on this so far. We have about uh, three or four minutes left. So, but we do have a question for you. Um, and the question is, what challenges uh, do, on the one hand, municipalities face to, the, to procure these uh, technologies, these sustainable, circular, greener technologies? So the municipalities on one hand, and on the other hand, what are those um, challenges? Uh, what challenges do the technologies face uh, to enter the procurement process? So, you know, what are the challenges that the munici municipalities are facing um, to procure these these technologies? And, and you know, are the, what 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 sort of resolution and resilience do we have in the technologies? The, the problem I would say uh, very much is that the, um, uh, it's very, very difficult for um, for the municipalities to to do a procurement of not proven technologies uh, not yet ready technologies. Um, they have to stick to what the policy, the policies are today and they need to stick to what what has been proven to work. Um, so um, and there, it's also a very strict uh, price 
price tag to everything. So um, I would say that the challenges are really very much the, the risk of, of procuring new technologies and also these wastewater treatment plants and, and the municipalities owning big infrastructure. So um, there is a very much a doubt on where they go for, for uh, which kind of technology will impact on, on further down the line on, on who is going to take care of, of, of that product that comes out of, of one way of working or another way of working, as we have seen in the previous presentations in bonus return. So it's, it's very much uh, unsurety around policies and regulations on, on, on sludge and, and wastewater in general. So I think um, to put together a buyer's group, uh, a group of, of municipalities into uh, and to do a, a real, um, perhaps a pre-commercial procurement uh, could be a, a quite a good way of moving forward to have that risk sharing. Then it becomes a, a bigger scale innovation competition and you, we will get some interesting cases to work further on with. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm, I'm going to go back to this uh, innovation or innovative development cycle you presented a little earlier. And, um, and you said that, in fact, you took the T off the readiness level. So it's not um, TRL, but it's RL because you're looking at other factors than just the technology. You're looking at some of these questions like, you know, can it work with the municipalities and social impacts. So is this something that is new? Um, was this something you brought in for this project or is, are other people also using RL as, as a standard concept? Um, sorry, Mike is off. So you're going to have to start over. <laughs> Stan. Yeah, all right. So, uh, well, it's, it's actually a development throughout this project and, and some parallel projects uh, where the discussion around technology, the, the T became a little bit, uh, took a too much um, attention from the discussion because everything is about readiness um, to the market. And, and um, uh, so therefore, the, we took, we have actually developed the T. We haven't, we, I've seen some other um, uh, examples where where they discuss uh, readiness levels and they put in other types instead of T, they could have um, uh, business readiness levels or whatever. But we just said that let's take away the T to avoid too much discussions about technology because market success is so much more about communication, service, quality, business models and everything. And you have to just be ready to, to get a market success. So that the, therefore we, we took, but I, I think the, the TRL, I mean, the word technology in the TRL scale is, is uh, seen as a, a, a bigger notion, but we, we just thought it was, was good to take it away. But I don't have very good examples on, on other projects that have done mm -hmm. the same, but this is very new, I would say. I haven't seen the cycle and the readiness levels in, in, other, uh, in other projects yet. Okay. Uh, we are open to, to, to hear if somebody has some more inputs on, uh, on that. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Stan. We're going to move on to the next paper, and it will be given by Lynn Yanberry from SEI and also Nelson Ekani at SEI. And they're going to talk about barriers and opportunities for closing the loop, the nutrient loop in the Baltic Sea region. Um, there we have the picture. And uh, Lynn, you have 10 minutes, and then Elton Nelson, you've got 10 minutes, and then we'll have five minutes for, for questions. So I guess it's Lynn that's starting, right? All right, so this is Lynn Jan Bay speaking from Stockholm Environment Institute, and uh, I'm going to share some findings from a paper uh, that I have co-authored together with uh, Karina Barquette, uh, Arna Rosemarin, and Biliana Makura. And the central question for us in this paper has been 
um, what is needed to accelerate the transition towards a circular phosphorus economy in the Baltic Sea region. Um, and we have looked here at both barriers and opportunities within the wastewater sector and the agriculture sector. Next slide, please. Um, just to say something very brief about methods, we have combined a literature review here, a so-called rapid review approach with key informant interviews. And for our analysis, we used a framework synthesis approach. And I'm not going to go into details about the analytical framework that you can um, see here in the picture as the dark uh, blue headings, but I'd rather focus on the results here. Uh, and this is a little bit of a complex figure perhaps, but I'll try to walk you through it step by step. So everything um, that you see having a minus sign here is barriers that we have found across the system. Everything with a plus sign is referring to an opportunity. And so if we're starting from the top with the articulation dimension, this is referring to a system's capacity to anticipate user needs and act upon them. Uh, first barrier that we found here is the price of phosphate ore and low market price of conventional fertilizer, which has contributed to the low profitability of waste derived products on the market. Um, looking into the future, we can probably expect this to change um, and, and expect the price to go up since there's um, a combination of rising demand for phosphate and shrinking reserves. Nonetheless, uh, we do also identify a need for government intervention to enable reuse products to compete with conventional fertilizers and uh, environmental externalities and also health impacts related to the production of conventional fertilizers are largely unaccounted for today across the EU, which could motivate either government subsidies on waste derived fertilizer or taxation on conventional fertilizer. If we look at the category of directionality, this is referring to the capacity of a system to guide the direction of change, including formulating a shared long-term vision. One of the barriers that we see here is a lack of policy steering for nutrient reuse at all levels, basically, and there's no clear vision for nutrient management and outdated legislation in many cases. One important opportunity here is the EU Circular Economy Action Plan, although um, we also note that this vision largely remains to be translated into national and local level policy and action. Uh, phosphate rock has been listed by the EU since 2014 as a critical raw material, and this is an opportunity that is indicating higher policy priority within the EU. An opportunity that we see at national levels is that new legislation has been introduced in Switzerland and Germany, for example, that is providing more long-term strategies for phosphorus management. Um, a little bit of a warning flag that we uh, are raising here is the risk of new lock-ins to, due to this kind of legislation, since it tends to favor one particular technology, which is mono incineration in this case, um, which is requiring large infrastructures and investments. If we look at the dimension that we're calling capabilities, this is referring to competences, knowledge, resources. Um, we note that there's a lack of knowledge still of many uh, technologies for phosphorus reuse when it comes to economic, agricultural and environmental performance. Um, on uh, on the other hand, there are also several technologies that are already established or underway in many places. And this is the case, for example, for struvite and monoincineration. Looking at interactions, um, this is referring to the exchange and networks between actors. Uh, we see as a barrier here that there's an uneven playing field between waste derived and conventional fertilizers and uh, fertilizer regulations have traditionally been designed with conventional fertilizers in mind, and so um, waste derived products do often not fit very well um, within these frameworks. And we also looked at values, and this is um, norms, attitudes, worldviews, and here uh, one of the key barriers is uh, related to farmer acceptability and ease of use of reuse products. Um, and farmers and also the fertilizer industry is requiring a constant and predictable product. And this is a challenge 
um, for, for example, manure based products and sewage sludge ash. Another barrier here, and this is um, well known, I guess, but um, the social acceptability related to sewage sludge derived products. Um, there are known and perceived risks of contamination here from, for example, heavy metals and pathogens. If we look at the coordination dimension, this is referring to the organization between different components or actors of a system. We see that in the agricultural sector, one barrier is that uh, manure is an abundant resource, but still very underutilized. Um, and this can be explained in part by farm specialization and a geographical mismatch of where livestock farms and crop production systems are located. Um, there are also certain logistical challenges in transporting manure. An opportunity that can be mentioned here is that only about 8% of all manure generated in the EU today is processed. And so um, there is potential here to use um, simple technologies that are available to reduce volumes and transportation costs. Our final dimension here that we looked at is structure, which is physical, uh, financial or institutional infrastructures. And here, one of the key barriers that has also been addressed by others is the slow rate of change that's characterizing wastewater systems, especially. Uh, we have large scale infrastructure and long term investment horizons, which is uh, creating lock in effects in the system. Mm -hmm. Another barrier is the legal recognition of reuse products that I also touched upon a little bit before. Um, but so products originating from wastewater treatment plants um, are, have traditionally been treated as waste. And so for those products, transport and trade are strictly regulated. Uh, one very important opportunity here is the recently updated EU fertilizing products regulation, just now recognizing a lot of reuse products as fertilizers. And this is important to level the playing field between reuse and mineral fertilizers. Um, but it should be noted also that not all reuse products are yet included in this regulation. For decentralized and source separating systems, we do see that one opportunity is that niche markets exist for those solutions, especially in sparsely populated areas and in newly constructed housing. Um, the aging infrastructure in many parts of the Baltic Sea region uh, is also an opportunity since this may push existing water and sanitation systems towards a turning point and open up for alternative solutions. Next slide, please. So we have formulated a few recommendations based on this research. Um, the first one is that um, there's a need to shift mindsets or continue to shift mindsets uh, away from the take, make, dispose mindset and more towards the reduce, reuse, recycle, recover mindset. Um, there's room for new circular business models with increased collaboration between wastewater treatment plants, fertilizer industry and farmers. Implementation capacity would need to be increased at national and local government levels to translate the circular economy vision into implementation. We see a role here also for sustainable public procurement. There is a need to um, improve interactions between the wastewater and agricultural sector, as well as between crop and livestock farms. Alternative solutions such as source separation should be more actively supported to enable the reuse of multiple resources. And it could, for instance, be made a requirement in newly developed housing projects. Um, the sixth point here is a large one, but um, there's a need to change farm structures uh, towards more diverse and integrated farming systems, and this would allow for more efficient use of manure and other nutrient sources in agriculture. Um, there are also strong arguments for government interventions such as subsidies or taxation to ensure a fair phosphorus price that reflects the uh, um, health and environmental impacts from phosphate mining. And finally, um, we see that new technology lock-ins can be avoided by considering their systemic impacts, um, including on other nutrients, carbon, water and energy 
and more flexibility in legislation is necessary to avoid crowding out promising and locally appropriate solutions. And the ultimate purpose of that, of course, would be to avoid solving one problem at the expense of another. And that's all for me. Thank you very much. That's great then. So we're going to move now right away to the Nelson Aikane. That'll be the next slide, I guess. Yes, thank you, Anu. Thank you, Anu. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, to spread or not to spread sewage sludge on agricultural land in Sweden is a question that we are confronted with. We have explored this question in the bonus return project, and this is what I will be talking about in the next 10 minutes. I am Nelson Ekane and I have a background in planning and decision analysis. Next slide, please. Sewage Lodge contains resources, uh, phosphorus, nitrogen, potassium, carbon, uh, essential for plant growth. Sewage Lodge also contains uh, unwanted substances, um, just to name a few, heavy metals, non-degradable microplastics, pathogens, antibiotics, polyfluorinated hydrocarbons, and substances of concern, which can cause harm to human and environmental health if not properly managed. This resource and risk trade-off uh, is a subject of a long-standing contentious and polarized debate in Sweden. And this persists even though the quality of Swedish sewage sludge has significantly become better over the years thanks to the REVAC certification system. A ban on spreading sewage sludge on agricultural land is even being discussed and was, was part of the terms of reference of the recent inquiry on sewage sludge. And this is in line with the Swedish environmental quality objective to create and maintain a non-toxic environment. Next slide, please. So we have examined how people see and explain uh, the risks and potentials of spreading sewage sludge on agricultural land and what this means for the society. Uh, to what extent are we familiar with the risks how people deal with the conflicts of trying to get gains and at the same time confronted with the probability of something bad happening uh, in short and long term. This is done by drawing on risk perception literature and qualitative data from semi-structured interviews with 17 key stakeholders, including farmers spreading sludge and farmers not spreading sludge. Consumers were not part of this study. Next slide, please. Here you have an illustration uh, of the organizational arrangements in the distribution of REVAC certified sludge. This also illustrates the flows of nutrients and risks in the society. Within this arrangement, farmers are key actors, uh, but not major drivers of the practice as we find. Entrepreneurs play an important role in creating demand for sewage sludge among farmers and making a sludge available to farmers. Find that transparency and mutual trust is important in determining the quality of what farmers receive uh, as REVAC certified sludge and what they produce as cereals it's from wheat, barley, oat. Farmers are expected to indicate where, whether cereals have been fertilized by sewage sludge or not upon delivery to food retailers. We also find that there is a geographical uh, aspect to this, uh, which is linked to availability of manure. Uh, and that explains why we have uh, less interest in the west coast of Sweden, uh, unlike in Uppsala and Stockholm region. And this has to do with animal husbandry, which is a common practice in the, the west coast, which is not in the Uppsala uh, and, and Stockholm region. And there you have, in Uppsala, you have uh, soils that are very poor in, in nutrients and organic matter. So farmers are willing to, to accept sludge. Next slide, please. I will use the following quotes uh, to summarize some of the major perceptions uh, we have gathered. Following from the first quote, uh, pureness beats recycling. Uh, we find that people have become, or are increasingly becoming more concerned about risks 
uh, people feel more vulnerable uh, to risks of contamination by toxic substances uh, than ever before. This is particularly the case for risks that we are unfamiliar of. However, one farmer uh, spreading sludge observes that, I quote, uh, spraying pesticides on crops may be more dangerous than spreading sludge as an agricultural input. But spraying pesticide is an acceptable risk for many people. Uh, this begs the following question. What is particular about sewage sludge that makes it unacceptable if pesticides and sludge both post, post risks? So the origin and nature and characteristics of sewage sludge seems to be an important factor here. And we'll come back to that. And this takes us to the last two quotes on the screen, which has to deal with stigma there and uncertainty, which we have heard in previous presentations, which actually are uh, overshadowing uh, sewage sludge. We have, as we saw uh, from the interviews, uh, stigma comes up as a key issue uh, from many, including the farmers. Uh, and there, there's a lot of uncertainty when it comes to dealing with the risks, measuring, monitoring, and the fit of, of the risk in long, long term. On the ban on sewage sludge, most interviewees showed preference for option two. Option two, as you have on the screen there, is a ban on condition that uh, possible risks are to be managed. These are recommendations from the recent inquiry on sewage sludge in Sweden. Uh, these interviewees emphasize that uh, this kind of option would require shared responsibility in terms of costs, uh, mutual trust and oversight of different stakeholders, as well as the contribution of different societal activities to the problem. We have, however, have two interviewees who actually are for option one. These are NGOs. Uh, an NGO and a government agency which are responsible for monitoring chemicals in, in, in Sweden. They emphasize the risks, uh, they have amplified it and would rather see a complete ban as option one. As you see on the screen, that's kind of end of the pipe control as described by one of our uh, interviewees. Next slide, please. To conclude, yeah, with some ways forward, uh, so anytime there are numerous unknowns and uncertainties about substances and their risks, in this case, substances we are unfamiliar about, we can control uh, in short and long term, feelings take over. This has a lot of uh, backing within the uh, literature in perceptions of, of risk. And this is a case with sludge. Um, we can actually see that in the arguments that uh, have been made by even those who are engaged in the practice, the farmers that are engaged and the entrepreneurs. And we find that feelings depend on how familiar we are with the risks and determines how we decide to deal with these risks. Uh, when risks are judged to be unknown by scientists, as is the case with the debates that we have, uh, which is quite polarized and uh, amplified and attenuated in different cases, the public sees the risks as more serious and less acceptable. And that is the risk we would have to, uh, in terms of communicating uh, uh, the risk of, of, of using human, uh, uh, waste of human origin, we would have to overcome this. Uh, by actually providing answers to some of the unknowns that we have. This underlines the conflict and, uh, between facts and feelings, which is a theoretical underpinning of this. Um, and actually, the, I would say, exemplifies the debate that we see in the sector. Further, uh, this has implications on uh, how consumers, uh, which we have not looked at, uh, would actually perceive this and get involved in it. So it has an implication on public trust. And without public trust, we have issues of communicating risk. It's as effective as we would want to, to have it. So what ends up in sewage lodge, as comes from one of our quotes uh, from the interviews, uh, is actually uh, as kind of uh, a description of what we have in the society, the different activities that we, we have in the society. And this actually emphasizes upstream work. So 
this is already ongoing within the RevAC certification system, and uh, we had respondents emphasize this even more uh, in connection with option two of the, the inquiry. And this is critical in reducing uh, the loads of these toxic substances that end up in sewer sludge, which actually we have you know, we're dealing with now. And also understanding the contribution of different activities to the problem is important. Um, we, for example, have the clothing industry. Uh, we have imported food, which also play an important role in, in what ends up in sludge, um, because we have systems which collect this uh, com combination. And this is uh, something which we'll have to, to work even further. These are areas of further research, um, possibly also understanding consumer perceptions. is also an area which we would uh, get more insights. So I'll end here and uh, wait for questions. OK, thank you, Nelson, and thank you, Lynn. Uh, we're running a bit late here. We have time for one question, and it is to Lynn. And the question is, uh, can you give some examples of how we can improve the interactions um, between the different types of farms, crop farms, livestock farms? Um, well, I don't know what that question actually means in terms of improving interactions, but I guess it has to do with with how they are treated in terms of of um, all the different um, barriers and opportunities. Yes, thank you very much for this question. It's not an easy one, I think, but I would say in the longer term and what I was also touching upon a little bit in the presentation was that I think one of the issues is the the farm specialization and very large scale uh, agriculture that's dominating the countries around the Baltic Sea region. So in the longer term, one way forward would be um, to move towards more diverse and integrated farming systems. Um, in the shorter term, uh, have to look at other solutions and there I think it's uh, probably not feasible for sort of individual um, farmers to in increase their coordination, but there would be um, space for more of sort of bridging actors and umbrella organizations that can connect um, farmers across uh, different geographical locations. Hmm. Well, that's a good answer under, under time pressure. Thank you for that, Lynn, and I'm going to uh, close this this paper and we will then quickly move to uh, the next one, which is Mark, given by Mark Rasmussen. He's actually working for SCI, but this morning he's, um, and it is still morning for him, he's calling in from Massachusetts where he has a residence. And Mark's going to look at the success stories of some of these eco-technologies in the Baltic Sea region. And there's three of these stories he will tell us about. So you have 10 minutes for that, um, Mark. And after the uh, presentation by Mark, we will then actually present some questions to the Swedish Finnish and Polish uh, project uh, leads for the case studies for the three um, river basins. So, um, so are we? Are, do we have you online, Mark? I, th I think. You, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, we can. Hi. Okay. Great. Good morning. Um, well, good. Well, thank you, Arno. Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, as Arno mentioned, I will uh, present the uh, three policy brief papers that we prepared as part of the project. Um, and if we go to the first slide, we could see the, the authors here. So we looked at success stories of circular eco technologies in the Baltic Sea region uh, with one each and each of the key, the project catchments. Um, on the authors, I'd love to recognize the authors here starting. Um, uh, myself, Karina and Arno were on all three briefs, um, but in Finland, we were joined by Yari Koskiaho and Sirka Tatari uh, for the Finnish paper. In Poland, with um, Marek Gilgevski and uh, Andrei Wojtovic joined us. Uh, Andrei from Sloop Waterworks itself, which we'll talk about. 
and in Sweden by Ole Osen and Casper Trimmer joined us on the Swedish paper. Next slide, thanks. So the, the first paper um, is a very interesting um, developing project in Finland, uh, the role of gypsum soil amendments in reducing coastal nutrient runoff in Finland. Uh, so we all know phosphorus runoff from agricultural fields in southern Finland is the greatest threat to water quality in this part of the Baltic Sea, in many, many parts of the Baltic Sea. Um, and that decades of attempts of traditional farmer best management practices to reduce this pollution have, by traditional methods, have proven inadequate. Uh, so this new opportunity uses gypsum waste, uh, originally now from the um, process of phosphorus mining, the leftover waste, as a soil amendment on fields, uh, literally spreading gypsum on fields to improve soil structure and therefore improve the retention of phosphorus and preventing runoff. And in early pilots over the last few years, uh, what we found was that reduced phosphorus and sediment runoff from pollution from fields by 50%. Um, this practice is showing a 50% reduction in runoff of phosphorus. Uh, slightly, slight reductions in demand for virgin mined phosphorus, so there's so much, although there's so much uh, virgin mined phosphorus happening, it's hard to make a dent in that, um, but it is requiring less use of virgin mined phosphorus, and it's getting rid of an industrial waste. Uh, the Most of the pilots in Finland to date have used uh, waste from a Yara plant uh, producing phosphorus, a mine, and so that's where the, the source of the gypsum has been. Next slide. So the impact uh, and some recommendations for further action, uh, the potential impact here is very promising. Um, it's looking like viable it's a viable nutrient reduction technique for 540,000 hectares or a quarter of all arable land in Finland. And this map, if you can see here in the brown, mustard brown, yellow color, shows all of the fields where this technique may be applied. So it really is quite far reaching. Um, moreover, if uh, this practice was applied to similar coastal farmlands in Sweden, Denmark, and Poland, um, the amount of phosphorus load prevented from the Baltic is about 10% of the total amount recommended, the total load reduction recommended by Helcom. So you can see a lot of why a lot of people are excited by the application of this idea. Um, uh, as an early idea, uh, it, it risks a number of uh, factors of getting started too fast in all the excitement over the idea. I think the first recommendation we had was that it requires a national plan in Finland to promote and integrate this practice into the agricultural support scheme. Um, beginning to start having the government think about how to provide subsidies to farmers to cover the cost of gypsum use. And when you think about uh, application beyond Finland in particular, uh, amendments are needed to the EU common agricultural policy to promote this practice. Um, and there's a good opportunity coming up in 2021 with um, the next amendments to that process. And lastly, just additional research is needed all over the Baltic countries. Uh, you don't want to rush into something too quickly where it's not being looked at case by case in other areas with other soil types and other watersheds. So we, we think other Baltic countries should be looking at this. Uh, the second brief and Nelson's presentation just uh, prior here was very helpful. The second one looked at the implication of new national policies on the management of sewage sludge in Uppsala. So we looked at the issue mentioned a number of times today about the 2018 Swedish government inquiry on looking at a ban on sewage sludge. Um, and the January 2020 inquiry findings came out right as we were putting this uh, policy brief together. The thing was a, a moving target in a lot of ways, but made for a very rich discussion. Um, the two alternatives we've talked about, a complete ban or a limited ban with uh, more standards on um, what can be in the sludge before application. Um, I think this brief looked at specifically how does that affect a, a community like Uppsala, which has invested heavily in reuse in, uh, and is a leader in the REVAC program and is considered a front runner in sustainability policies in many ways. How does this policy affect them? Next slide. Um, so I think the overarching thing is that as Sweden moves forward with the national policy directives, they need to slow down enough to involve municipalities and the users who will be the primary funders so that they are very much involved in the planning. And I think from, uh, from all of our perspective uh, and what we're hearing from many people is option number two, whereby sewage flood application is still allowed on farmland, but under stricter quality standards is more preferable for a number of circular economy goals than uh, a total ban. Uh, because uh, we want to protect the successful upstream source reduction efforts of programs like REVAC. Um, you don't want the move away from sewage sludge use to allow for looser uh, upstream uh, pollution control. So that's an important thing to preserve here in this transition. Obviously, municipalities need time to implement these changes. 
And we, we thought it's important, everybody's thinking about phosphorus, the demand for phosphorus in the sewage sludge. But, you know, sewage sludge has a range of societal values, particularly the, the benefit of organic matter and sludge, uh, which is lost in a lot of the incineration um, alternative technologies. You want to be able to look at not just phosphorus, but organic waste and other, other values of sludge. So that was the Swedish case. And last one was, was a very interesting uh, cluster in, uh, in Slupsk in, uh, on the northern coast of uh, Poland. Um, the Slupsk bioenergy cluster is a new paradigm for local circular economy in renewable waste and in renewable energy and waste recycling. So the Sloop bioenergy cluster um, this year reaches a very interesting milestone where it will turn on its distribution system and link 20 businesses with a network of city facilities, 40,000 electricity users, 120,000 wastewater customers, and an innovative renewable energy sharing and waste recycling system. Um, basically, the Sloop's wastewater treatment plant, the municipal plant, receives waste in the form of sewage and compost materials from businesses and residents of this municipality um, and turns that around into electricity, heat, um, fertilizer, sludge-based fertilizer, a number of products that put energy in, uh, waste, waste in and produce energy out. Next slide. Um, as an early leader, um, this project is, is exposing a lot of policy and regulatory changes that are needed to advance more decentralized energy waste reuse systems in the Baltic region. Uh, first off, um, the severely, the very strongly locked in position of fossil fuel energy companies presents really serious challenges. Uh, Sloops has had to build this entire system independent of the main grid. So they are laying their own distribution lines for electricity because they were not allowed to share lines uh, with the fossil fuel providers, which are primarily still coal. So in order to do this, they are doing this all on the side of the traditional system, which is extremely inefficient um, and discourages further investments like this. Um, we found that all levels of government can do more to stimulate these kind of cooperation platforms. Uh, things like tax incentives for energy producers to integrate waste recycling in their processes. Uh, Sloops is uh, laying a path for how this can get done in lots of communities, but government could do a lot more to stimulate that cooperation. And just as in the sludge case and in the Finnish case, uh, better EU regulations, and in this case, the RED2 directive, which eases the scale up of decentralized local based models like Slupsk. Um, those would be very helpful here. Um, so with that, we were very fortunate to have uh, wonderful experts in each of the catchments working on these cases with us. And uh, I guess from there, I'm turning it over to them, Arno. Great, great. Thank you, Mark. Um, full of energy. That's really good. So I'm going to actually do it backwards because uh, you, you just presented the Polish case with the Slupsk bioenergy cluster. Um, and I'm going to ask Marek um, a little question that, about the challenges that the, the bioenergy cluster had, was facing during the implementation. And if you can tell us some of the inside stories about that. Uh, hi, hi everybody. I, I think it, it was a bit sad at the end of the Mark's presentation, yeah, the, 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 those challenges. Uh, so, 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 so the, 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 the cluster, of course, it's um, technically and, and, and the idea is it's pretty important, but uh, I think what, 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 what is interesting about that, that it happened, yeah, that this is kind of a pioneer uh, uh, initiative and without uh, some uh, uh, innovators like, like, like the Swoops wastewater treatment plant, it wouldn't happen. Yeah? So, 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 so one of the challenges, in, in, at least in our situation in, in such case, it's to have a strong uh, innovator, somebody with a vision that, that, that likes uh, to, to carry out uh, uh, such, uh, uh, such uh, investment. And, and then, of course, uh, the, 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 some of the, of the main challenges is that uh, this is new and it's not recognized. So, so, so actions that were necessary to uh, establish and, and, and carry on uh, this, this, this cluster, um, uh, it, 
it, it requires new new actions and and for instance this uh, kind of the major obstacle of uh, uh, traditional uh, energy uh, companies not willing to cooperate yeah they simply neglected uh, su such initiative they, they didn't cooperate uh, even uh, with the small small things that requires for instance building on a grid network uh, to connect uh, uh, all the partners in, in this cluster mm. so so so, so uh, that there were i mean uh, quite many uh, challenges uh, practical and also legal yeah that, that that it was initiative that was not uh, recognized that n never happened happened before mm. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, just a little teeny question with a very teeny little answer. Question is, what's the energy system in this in this project? Is it anaerobic digestion or incineration? It, it, it is uh, anaerobic digestion. It's biogas. Okay, yeah. that's great. So I'm going to actually then go to the the second presentation that Mark gave, and I'll be asking Ole Olson. Uh, who is in charge of, of the Furison, the, the Swedish uh, case study. So Ole, um, there's a lot of discussions in Sweden around whether or not um, uh, sludge should be used as a fertilizer. I think Nelson was, was talking about that. Um, but how, is this a new discussion in Sweden? Well, you can say that the discussion is uh, pretty much as old as civilization itself. <laughs> Um, because uh, I was reading up in some background research and it turns out some people who are claiming that um, one reason why China, for example, has been uh, a political entity for thousands of years is that it's uh, it had this long established tradition of using human waste as fertilizer uh, in comparison with Europe, which is sort of wading back and forth over the centuries. Um, but which it still is in a way, because if you just take the Swedish example uh, right now, as Nelson was alluding to, and, and Mark as well, is this governmental investigation that was uh, uh, released in, in January and which is um, it's been up for public consultation. And uh, you know, you think, well, it's a public consult, uh, it's a governmental investigation. Well, that seems like a big thing, but I think it's actually the third uh, of those investigations on this particular topic in only the last two decades, something like that. So it's it's this uh, issue that keeps going around and around. Hmm. Um, so where do you think this inquiry is going to land? I mean, can you can you make a prediction? Uh, I can't. <laughs> I was looking through the the responses from the public consultations this morning, and it, it's pretty much um, uh, a lot of a lot of uh, different opinions from different stakeholders. Um, and you know, it, it, taking a step back, it's interesting if you're a researcher to see well, there's a lot of interesting issues here. Um, to analyze in terms of risk perception and so on. But if you take the innovation perspective, if you're an entrepreneur or a, or a company or a, a municipality um, wanting to invest in, in solutions, this is obviously a, a really big obstacle uh, in terms of policy uncertainty and you know how do how do we you know position ourselves to whatever the rules going to be? Mm. Okay, it's not that easy. Um, I'm going to move now, now to Finland where we started. And it's, you know, it's about this uh, very innovative idea of trying to trap phosphorus in the soil by using gypsum, which is this product from uh, phosphorus extraction. So Yari, um, uh, what are the next steps then in this development uh, in Finland? Well, <clears throat> Uh, I, of course, I hope that uh, this this uh, method of gypsum application will 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 be it will be given a green light in terms of policies in both EU and national level. Because as Mark Mark just uh, presented, it's very very effective way of of reducing phosphorus and quite quickly. But uh, uh, in terms of uh, this Vantanjoki project where they have uh, spread this gypsum, uh, they will be starting a project in Syke that uh, in that project they will very likely to uh, assemble new automatic measurement devices in, in Pitkakoski in Vantanjoki. And uh, those, those devices will be uh, including dissolved phosphorus analyzer which is um, using this passive sampler principle. 
uh, and uh, this is just downstream of large gypsum amendments that have been uh, made in, in one time Yoki. And if that will happen uh, so that these devices will be built there, we will be able to uh, verify the effects of these amendments, gypsum amendments more reliably and more versatile than, than, than with the old devices. And and another interesting thing is that in uh, this one time Yuki gypsum project, they are planning to test natural gypsum. This, this uh, like Mark just said, this gypsum uh, that is now uh, now used is a product of Yara. It's kind of industrial product, and it doesn't mean to, to meet the standards of organic production. So if the, if this uh, if this natural gypsum proved to be viable. So also organic farmers can can uh, spread this gypsum into onto their fields. I'm sorry for the this connection for me. No, it's, it's okay. And I know Ludwig Hermann on on he's, he's online. He, he's asking, is this actually a real uh, option, or is it? I mean, is is it is it going to actually be? Is it an experiment, or is it really going to take off? Uh, you mean this gypsum application or this, yeah. <laughs> this device? I, I think it, it's it's not an experiment uh, anymore. It's it's very very largely used in Finland now in in uh, archipelago sea and Gulf of Finland, and we are very very anxious to see uh, what's the actual effect and if we have these new measurement monitoring devices, mm -hmm. so we will be able to verify the effects. Fantastic. Okay, I'm resting along here. Um, and I thank you, all four of you, for the, this little session. Thank you, Mark, for the presentation as well. We're going to go to Uppsala uh, University, and it's Stephen Batchelder, who's an expert on playing to learn. And he's going to actually walk us through some really interesting uh, gaming, serious gaming um, procedures here to see if we can learn something about what we've been talking about today. So I hand it over to you, Stephen. OK, thank you. Um, so what I'll be looking at uh, is just showing you a brief um, uh, sort of uh, walkthrough of the game and some of the mechanics and things like that. But uh, before I begin, I just uh, need to explain that this was a deliverable uh, work package six and task 6.2 with my colleagues from Uppsala University, Neil Powell and Tao Do. So um, what we've used here is a, is a term, uh, a serious game system, which is a little bit different from a serious game in as much as it's not prescriptive, but rather it's investigative. So, so we're looking at dynamic systems and the, 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 the dynamics of these systems through explorative play. Um, so in this sense, we're using it to provide a, a safe, a creative and inclusive learning space for the stakeholders that invite for deliberation over the feasibility and um, of the different constellations of e eco technologies and developments. So um, by having stakeholders uh, use this and using their their perspectives, choices and actions, we can actually test uh, some different constellations and viabilities of these. So if you uh, move uh, the next slide. Yeah, so here's here's what's met or what players meet as the as the objectives to the game. So and it's to reduce nutrient emissions from land use systems while optimizing the product the productivity of these systems. So you have resources um, with which you purchase eco technologies and developments, and then you make uh, constellations of these and see how they play against each other in as much as the data uh, from the data coming in from the other work packages and what we know about the catchment areas and the flows of nutrients. So the middle area there represents the Baltic Sea and uh, you have two teams, one that's indigo on the left and on the right you have Azur. And each one of these have catchment areas that are identical to each other. Um, and they also in the middle have a shared a shared zone. I'm actually trying to point to my screen here. I see that didn't work. Um, and there are these two areas in the middle of the Baltic Sea where the ownership is not really clear. So it's sort of first come first serve because we do know that borders sometimes are contested and and sometimes it is 
there's un, there's dynamics in the system as to who who owns what and who's able to do what and and what the impacts of those might be. So this is where the one of those aspects where the uh, stakeholders and the players of this game uh, have to negotiate or find themselves in conflict. Um, if we go to the next slide, and you'll see that there's um, three land use areas uh, apart from the Baltic, and it's the the forest, um, the urban, and the agriculture. And these were uh, weighted with different um, nutrient flows in the game and fed into the game systems. So if you were playing uh, the, the Finnish version or the Swedish version or the Polish version, those numbers would be different as the, the flows going through the system. If you can take the next slide. Um, and then we're looking at the flows. I think you'll see that um, what we've done here is there's flows coming into the systems or into the tiles respectively, and then those flows ultimately uh, run into the Baltic Sea. Um, yeah, you can go to the next slide. And this is what the game looks like. And then, okay, so here's, a, here's what the white, the white arrows represent the flows. So there's different places here where you can put developments on the the hexagons towards the outer rim and on the inner rim, rim there are ecotechnologies. So the idea is that they neutralize one another and that the, the nutrients in the flows can be used as a positive um, element in some of the developments or in some of the echo developments which we have as well. The red arrows signify the flows of the nutrients themselves. So if you go to the next slide and, and stop there for a moment, you'll see the, the little items in the playing field uh, to the left bottom, those are uh, developments and they're generating a lot of nutrients and the nutrients go through the flow. Um, yeah, thanks. The nutrients go through the flow and then they run into the Baltic Sea. Now, if there's no ecotechnologies there, the, the flow is on a, it's unfiltered, it just continues straight out. But as you'll see, there's plenty of opportunity to put other items on those locations to reduce those flows or to use those uh, flows as a resource. Um, you can go to the next um, thing. So we had uh, two different versions of this. The, the, the whole idea of a serious gain system is you go from a dialogue, uh, a conversation about systemic properties uh, that concern stakeholders, and you go from, from dialogue to uh, rich pictures and then to increasingly systemic representations of how their agency as stakeholders um, impact or able to impact uh, the Baltic Sea and, and what affordances they have in their roles as stakeholders. What, are, what does the system allow for them to do and how do they use that? One way of doing that is to increasingly um, um, solidify a systemic representation through play. So the first, um, the first versions of the board game were learning about having a serious game system as a foundation upon which the stakeholders would play and then start to design their uh, eco technologies and their developments and rate them as in accordance of what they thought the the properties were for the respective um, respective pieces. And the interesting thing was that they, they did discuss this, and this is in Sweden, and um, they, they did some not always agree. And it was interesting when they came in, uh, in disagreement. And uh, uh, another interesting thing was to see the stakeholders in play actually really uh, wanting to win. It was important for them to win. Now this, if you look at this slide just a minute, um, these are some of the, the um, ecotechnologies that were proposed by the stakeholders as being important to this particular group of stakeholders. Uh, what we saw from the different sessions uh, in the different catchment areas and also in the different stakeholders that there was lots of overlapping, but there was, there was differences and nuances uh, within the way that they approach these ecotechnologies. Um, so it was interesting to see, and this was re reflected also in the the um, the reports coming in from the other stake, uh, the other work packages, 
is that there was a considerable amount of overlapping, but not always. So when we went from the board games, we had to systemize all of these um, and give them a numerical, assign them numerical values on the basis of um, a collection of, of data coming in from the work package as well as the, the stakeholders is what they, how they felt, uh, what, what was reasonable. Uh, and these were compiled into um, uh, Excel sheets. Um, yeah, you can take the next slide. And then these stakeholders were represented systemically in the in the digital version of the game. Now the nice nice thing about the digital version, there's there's two versions here in the the, the board game first. Um, the board game, the nice thing about the board game was that the stakeholders themselves were had a wealth of knowledge which they could provide at all times. And they had a depth of experience that they could pull from when questions arose. Um, the problem with with doing real time calculations in a board game this complex is that the mathematics take up a considerable amount of the time and then you have to simplify to make the game playable, which that might reduce the fidelity of the representation. Whereas in a digital game like this, all the mathematics are done automatically, but it's very mechanical. There's, there's not an intuitive uh, interpretive um, space. Um, so these are some of the eco technologies that could be chosen. You can go through the to the next slide. Now we also had shocks in the system, and these could be uh, droughts or floods. Um, and um, this is a this is a flood shock in the system. And I think shortly we'll see a film of what this actually looks like. Um, so before we do that, so you. On this, you click on the actual, and there's an interface where you actually purchase your eco technologies and then place them on the board. Uh, not unlike Monopoly, but much more uh, dynamic. Um, so in here, you, yeah. Um, if you go back, yeah, there, okay. You see the top, there is um, a score. There's a whole bunch of barcode codes up, or up at the front or sliders. Now those are for the resources of the players, respectively, the value of their assets. So how much have how much have you accumulated in value, and then the emissions uh, that are produced. Um, how many emissions are being reduced? How many uh, emissions are being transformed? So emissions can can have be transformed by eco technologies as well, and then how many emissions are being um, released into the Baltic Sea? Now the score is an accumulation of those uh, parameters. So the um, the score detail slider is is who's winning, whether it's Indigo or Azure, on the basis of how their developments are progressing, while at the same time um, they're turning nutrients uh, into resources. You can take the next one. Um, these are the, um, the different rewards also. So there's uh, a series of rewards that the players can get, and that's if their constellations have achieved certain things within the SDGs. So um, this is in innovation and infrastructure, and those um, eco constellations, eco technology constellations that achieve these means um, provide goals and rewards for the players, which sort of uh, furthers their score. So you can take the next. I think we'll see. Yeah, uh, next slide. And this is a little film. I'll be quiet. You can turn up the volume so you can hear. This is a fire. So what happened here was the ones that are yellow, those need to be re, re, replaced or rejuvenated or repaired. Um, so it's so you're sort of also leveraging costs and vulnerabilities uh, for different system shocks. So this means that by listing all the vulnerabilities from the respective developments or eco shocks, 
um, and sort of having a, a statistical norm of those system shocks, one is also able to test this. Um, but in a game perspective like this, we have a, uh, an exaggerated uh, number of system shocks. They're, um, they're above and beyond. So, and this is also able for the players to, to, um, to influence if they like. They can have a very high rate um, or have a very, very low rate. Uh, depending on how that's the difficulty setting for the play. Um, yeah, you can take the next slide. Yeah, so that's that's basically um, the presentation of the game itself. It can be played at this link there on the bonus return uh, program under Serious Game System and Monitor Ecotech. Um, and it would be interesting if, if some of you tested it and gave some feedback on it. Um, yeah, it would be good for us to hear that. That's great, Stephen. Thank you for that. <clears throat> uh, we have a couple of questions regarding whether the digital version is available online and um, whether players can uh, get involved and play this game, um, uh, whether they whether they can do it themselves or does it need to be facilitated? Yeah, good questions. Um, the, the first one is it is available online with this link. So the, the, so it's just to use this link and, and it's on the bonus return homepage. Um, and the other one is it, it it is sort of built to facilitate a process of dialogue, but it can be played alone and, a, and there are learning outcomes to, to be had and it and it it's not entirely unfun. Um, and it's not entirely unscientific. It's it's, <laughs> but it's not entirely scientific. It's not entirely fun, uh, in the way that serious games are. They're 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 both uh, and neither, if you will. Um, but but I've I've had a, a group of quite young, um, experienced game players play it, and they they played it for hours and and didn't give it up. So, so I think the playability of it is it is is quite fun. But it's. It's to be played by two people sitting next to each other in dialogue so you can talk to each other. So I think that's the only thing. It's a little bit like playing chess in the same room rather than online against each other. So you should have the same shared location. What about that um, shocks? Can, they, can you choose a shock, for example, let's say if there's a drastic change in, in governments in one of the countries, such that people are not going to pay taxes for this yeah. kind of thing. Um, you can do that in a board game version because you have the capacity to sort of change or bend the rules and have that dialogue around it. But the, there are a limitation on the digital games, and that's that because it's all, you know, it, it's it's a computational system. So if that particular system shock isn't isn't built into the system, then you won't really be able to enact it. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, the, the the digital systems are are more limited, if you will, but they're more accurate in what they represent. Well, it's going to be exciting. So I thank you, Stephen, for that. Mm. Um, and we're going to keep going here on the last part of the agenda. Then is uh, we're going to go back to Karina Barquette, um, and she is going to give us some conclusions from. Uh, the project and also some recommendations. Please over to you, Karina. Thank you, Arna. We can go to the next slide. So we've heard about three hours of what Bonus Return has done. Uh, just to sort of synthesize, what we've done through these three years is to provide evidence of eco technologies in agriculture and wastewater. We've explored how robust different eco technologies are against a range of criteria within health and hygiene, environment, economy, social cultural issues and technical function. We've also also explored the policy market and technical barriers for circular solutions. We've supported three innovators and along the way we've learned quite a lot from them. So thank you for that. We've uh, developed tools for stakeholder engagement. Next slide please. But there is quite a lot to find out. Uh, bonus return is just a little stone in the whole uh, sea of research in the region. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we've tried to synthesize some of the discussions that we had in our um, most recent and, and, and final workshop uh, called um, 
blue mission, mission blue, <laughs> um, into three overarching themes. What is left? What do we think is left to get us a bit closer to closing the loop in terms of future research and policy? And uh, this is not an exhaustive list. I'm sure there's many other things that one could find out, but this is at least what came out of our own research. First thing is that we need to inform the vision that we are aiming at, uh, which is a Baltic Sea unaffected by pollution. For this, we need better understanding of hotspots, which is the areas at land, coast and the sea, where me measures could be more effective as well as the combinations of measures that can prove more effective for reducing and recycling nutrients and carbon. We also need longer term studies in agriculture to better assess plant uptake of hazardous substances and microplastics, but also to inform the development of future circular fertilizers. Within wastewater, we need to try longer time periods or cost benefit assessments or sustainability assessments. They need to, they need to try uh, beyond the 30 year threshold that we usually used in studies and account for environmental externalities. We hear increasingly the role that cloud based technologies are going to have for monitoring existing utilities, but we need to explore further how cloud based technologies could be used for diversifying solutions, both at the end of the pipe as well as at the source. Policy studies need to explore different scenarios to regulate fertilizers fertilizer levels, farm size and composition, which are better adapted to local realities. And this needs to inform the common agricultural policy and the farm to fork strategy. A second cluster of things that we need to do, or let's say if we, if we look at this as a, in a chronological order, is we need to align the vision with capacities. So through bonus return, we realize that some of the greatest challenges lie in the means of implementation rather than in the development of eco technologies per se. We know about existing and upcoming eco technologies, as we heard, but there is a general lack of capacity to procure for system solutions. There are numerous initiatives to collaborate across borders and across sectors, but many of these would benefit from greater or orchestration. We need to investigate further into what the right ways of organizing might be. For example, should we go for integral versus modular organization or how to integrate agile principles into uh, rolling out innovations? And when is cross-sectoral collaboration most efficient? Innovation in business development that explores how future partnerships, for instance, in utility provision could look like from a circular approach are much needed. In these business uh, plans or business development, we need to identify what roles different actors have and how these partnerships relate to the increasing importance of big data and cloud based technologies. A last cluster is turning the vision into action. We need to move away from linear to circular, but this requires approaching nutrients from a more solution oriented perspective and not only prohibition, which is what health come and let's say the strategy for the Baltic Sea has uh, focused on uh, mostly. And this is particularly important in the sectors which have most potential for recovering nutrients and carbon. We heard that we need to shift mindsets, but we also need to shift legislation and create incentives away from only reducing and towards creating more effective system of systems of use and reuse. We also need to shift focus away from ad hoc investments such as single purpose infrastructure and instead start developing general purpose and cross sectoral technologies. And in practice, this could look like uh, this could look something like looking at how wastewater treatment plants could be a source uh, or providers of raw materials for future fertilizers rather than seeing them as as treatment plants. We need more knowledge on the functioning of the entire value chain and the actors and responsibilities in a circular mode of operation. And this includes better understanding of consumers' attitudes, including changing diets, the role that food imports, imports versus increased food production nationally may play in the accumulation of nutrients, cadmium and hazardous substances, uh, but also how this could respond to concerns of food security. So I hope you're still hanging in there after this four uh, long uh, seminar. And this is sort of my wrap up. 
before I hand before I hand back over to Arno, I perhaps want to also thank everybody. Uh, we can move to the next slide. Who has been involved in this project? Uh, obviously, our financiers, our partners, and all the stakeholders in the region. Uh, thank you for this three years, and I hand over to you, Arno. Okay, thank you, Karina. And I mean, there's probably a more questions um, than answers when it comes to the Baltic Sea. It's probably the most studied uh, inland marine area uh, in the world. Um, and still we have questions about why the blue-green algae are still there year after year after year. Um, I think we're getting closer um, to understanding it and also to fixing it. And I think that's the message. And for those of you that aren't aware, the, there will be some interesting meetings to discuss uh, these questions and others at the um, meeting in, in Finland next month. And it's um, really to discuss the EU strategy for the Baltic Sea region, which is going to be um, renewed and, and updated. So hopefully some of the things coming out of bonus return will, will be tabled. Um, some of the learning. Um, so it's um, really then to thank you for participating. Um, thank you for the, for the people that logged in and listened right to the end, uh, provided some of the questions. Um, we thank again our partners um, for their um, interest and engagement in this final meeting. Um, we hope that you, you found this meeting useful. It's, um, it's not over. Um, you will be seeing other related projects coming down the tubes uh, from all the partners. And if you go to their websites, you'll see that, as well as the SEI website. And I know that a lot of the bonus um, websites seem to kind of disappear, and I'm going to make sure that um, the bonus return website doesn't. That you will always be able to go back to it um, for several years to come and um, access the publications when you need to. So uh, on that basis, I think there's there's one more picture here, isn't it? It's a kind of a, just a, a, um, a bit of a seascape. Um, I wanna thank Ian Caldwell um, for all of the technical support today. And for those of you that don't know, um, there are several of the attendees sitting in a hotel in Saltwebodden and in the archipelago of Stockholm. Um, so thank you for risking your health um, um, and you managed, I think, to, to make it right to the end. Everybody's on time. And uh, so my hat, which is not on, goes off to all of you and I thank you all and you have a very good evening and take care. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Enjoy. Yeah, yeah. Very well. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay.